The following program is an MLWRadio.com production. La Raza. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lenders. Woo! Today's episode of Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard is brought to you by our friends at BrandNewHouse.com. You see, at BrandNewHouse.com, you really can get a brand new house for less than your current rent. I know what you're thinking. It sounds too good to be true, but we can do it for you right now at BrandNewHouse.com. And the cool thing about Brand New House is everything's new, man. There's no repairs, and you get a warranty. Of course, everything's brand new. But maybe best of all, it's the freedom of choice, man. You get to pick everything on your brand new house, the color of brick the kitchen cabinets the countertops the flooring you pick it all even your monthly payment at brandnewhouse.com you don't need perfect credit you don't need money out of your pocket and it just takes about 10 minutes right now at brandnewhouse.com remember new is just better don't get an old used lived in house go create everything you want in your very own brand new house at brandnewhouse.com nmls number 65084 equal housing lender welcome to whw monday Tony Schiavone and Conrad Thompson. Jim Crockett for Starcade, 605 NWA. TV title, Cajun Omni, the Bunkhouse Stampede. Flair and Horseman, Garvin, Bogey, Magnum, Dusty, Express Tactics. Turner bought in Mid-South Joy World Championship Wrestling. Talking about the great years of World Championship Wrestling, the NWA and Jim Crockett Promotions. Tony and first North, they win. Look, Schiavone's back again. World title split off center stage. Bischoff, Disney, Hogan, and Nitro. New World Order and the Crow. Thunder Russo, Arquette Champ, Vinnie Mac, Simulcast. Tony's back with Conrad, not your classy podcast. Watch along, try not to laugh, lowest rules, cat back. This wasn't the initial plan, Tom Ziggs a good looking man. Klondike Bill, make a chair. Tommy, you come over here. What happened when? WHW Monday. And now, let's go to the ring. And here's your co-host, hey, hey. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to What Happened When? Monday on the MLW Radio Network, the man of the hours with us. Tony Schiavone, how are you, Con, sir? Conrad, a big week for the Schiavone family. The wedding comes up this weekend as we download this right now. Thanks to everybody who's been so nice to the Schiavone family. Thanks to you. Thanks to everybody out there. I do have a couple of words uh, on our What Happened When Facebook page coming up on Saturday, the 24th at 540 around that time, Eastern time, uh, log in and you'll see my uh, father, the bride speech. That's about what time it's going to be. My my daughter, Laurie, is so organized. She's got everything timed out to the minute. Uh, she should have worked for, for us with WCW. Maybe you wouldn't have run long in some of those shows. Uh, so that's going to happen then. Thanks to everybody. Hey, it's been a great run. Uh, I've enjoyed working with you. We're having a lot of fun. And man, we got a lot to talk about this week, don't we? We really do. One of the most requested shows of all time as we sort of wind down our What Happened When tour. Next weekend, of course, we're going to be recording. And then on March 26th, the exact same date that Nitro went down and we lost Tony Schiavone forever. So we thought. The Shivani wedding special. Da, 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 da. We're gonna have fun it's with gonna be that, unique. Man. Yeah, it's gonna be yeah. a great show. It'll be the cherry on top for us. Lots of questions like, uh, is the show really going away? Well, Tony hasn't changed his mind, but continue to pump him, man. It's at Tony Shivani twenty four on Twitter, and of course the archives are gonna stay up on YouTube, and uh, we've got a link for that on our Twitter as well at WHW Monday. But just go to YouTube. And search for what happened when Tony Schiavone, boom, there you'll see it. Uh, the calls will continue. It's business as usual. Uh, but you know, we don't want to roll the dice here. (coughs) Excuse me, but we are rolling the dice with uncensored 96, man. This is going to be quite the show and we're going to do it watch along style. So we're going to encourage you to go ahead and fire up your WWE network. Uh, the show runs long, it's two hours and 44 minutes. So uh, if we can get a little help from our friends, we'll get fired up and we'll have some fun today. How about if I do it in French?
It's time for Uncensored. Hulk Hogan, I may have a pumpkin head, but my pumpkin head will destroy you. <laughs> Hulk Hogan, I may be only two foot one, but they call me the Death Master. Hulk Hogan, I got the biggest dick in the business. Woo! <laughs> I can stand in the front yard and count the chickens in the back. Yeah, baby! What am I doing in another pay-per-view? Hulk Hogan, I need someone to rub me down. My beautiful body, I'll be in the cage taking you down. Am <laughs> I done laughing? Fuck it yet. Welcome to Uncensored 1996. The only place we can do Uncensored, ladies and gentlemen, is in Tupelo. Absolutely. And we're coming to you from Tupelo and the, uh, uh, what's the name of the building here? Oh, the Elvis Presley Memorial Coliseum. That's exactly right. There you see in the distance the cage, the structure. It is, what was this thing called again, Conrad? The, uh, the Doomsday Cage. Doomsday Cage. And we got quite a number of dipshits in here to bring you this Doomsday Cage. The Mega Powers, Hulk Hogan, and the Macho Man, Randy Savage. Hi, everybody. I'm Tony Schiavone, along with the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, and Bobby the Brain. He didn't, you got your zipper down, bud. Uh, so what? So what? It's uncensored. I can show my dick if I want to show my dick. So what? Yeah, I got it down. So there it is. Look at it if you want to. Wave at it. Well, keep your dick out if you like, uh, Dusty. What about it? His dick started out this big, and now it has shrunk down to that big. Dream, let's talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, you may want to talk about his dick, but I want to talk about my boobs because I used to take off my shirt, and these boobs right here used to drop down, down, way down to my belly. And if you want to talk about he and his dick, that's fine. But my boobs dropped all the way down to there. Yes, they did, Shivani. And I want to say it didn't matter because that's a bad motherfucker. Yeah, he was a bad motherfucker. But let me tell you this. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to watch this match with you guys. Doesn't matter who comes in the cage, who goes out. Well, I guess we're going to look at he and his dick and the boobs of Dusty Rhodes. And that's how the Open started, something like that. And uh, we're going to have a good match here, Conrad. Man, I tell you what, you know, this show sort of gets, uh, memorialized as being one of the worst shows ever, but I disagree, dude. It, the undercard here is tremendous. And here comes Gravitron himself. He's got a sparkling jacket. Like he likes it. And Eddie Guerrero at this point is certainly one of the most underrated performers in all of wrestling. Well, at this point, you're right. But as time went on, as we all know, he became uh, considerably one of the best ever, and he's going to have a match here with, uh, with Conan for the United States Heavyweight Championship. And, and this uh, this was a very interesting match and an interesting finish. And the fans of Tupelo were kind of into this stuff right now. I don't blame them. Uh, you're, you're right. It's, I always thought, I mean, we've talked about this. Isn't it great to start a show with a guy like Eddie Guerrero? Yeah, it's a hot opener, and uh, this is going to be something special here. This is Conan uh, in his original attire that he debuted with WCW long before he was K-Dog. And he was yo, yo, yo for the NWO. He was a Mexican superstar, man. And I think a lot of American fans maybe don't get sort of smarten them up. Tony, how big of a deal was Conan in Mexico? Conan was at, we used to say this on TV. Conan was the Mexican equivalent of Hulk Hogan. And he was, uh, held in high esteem. He had a very lavish lifestyle and he was just the big superstar in Mexico. We brought him in WCW in the early 90s, and I remember when I first saw him thinking, my God, this guy can do a lot of stuff. And as we went along, he became more and more involved in WCW. I don't think, Conrad, that we really appreciated Conan enough, and I'm saying that as a as a promotion, not as, as announcers, but as a promotion. Well, this show is something I really hope you're actually watching. Of course, we're trying to do these watch-along episodes where you don't really have to watch but I think you'll be really pleased with this card. There's a lot of good stuff on here. And this is, uh, an example of, uh, you know, what's going to happen to WCW over the next year. Of course, Nitro is going to continue to crank up, but 
it's, it's weird to sort of think about this show in a vacuum like this, because I did appreciate, you know, you've got Conan, you've got Eddie Guerrero. We're going to see lots of other great matches here. Steven Regal and fit Finley and just all kinds of stuff. But then you see the hokiness of the main event, which we're going to cover in great detail, but this happens literally what four months, three months prior to Scott Hall coming in and, and the NWO starting to become a thing. And it feels like years prior, the silliness of the, the dungeon of doom and, and Zeus returning as Z gangsta and all of that nonsense happened not a year before the NWO, a few months before the NWO. Isn't that crazy to look back at Tony? Yeah, it is crazy. And I want to tell you, I, I thought about this too, as I was watching this and I'm watching this and then I glance and I, and I know it's uncensored 96, but it didn't hit me until I kind of glanced to my left as I'm watching the network. And I see March 24th, 1996. Well, didn't Hulk Hogan turn to into the NWO at bash of the beach of the same year? Yeah. Is alive? And the answer is yes. Yeah. A- and you're right. This seems like years before the NWO, but, but we're in a time here when we are desperately trying to put Hulk Hogan over as a Superman that he was with Vince McMahon. We know he's a popular icon. Everybody knows the name, but now we want to make him the superstar of WCW as he was with the WWF. And, uh, this was, uh, the mega powers coming together. Two of their big stars. You know, I was at WrestleMania five when, uh, the mega powers collided Hogan and the macho man, Randy Savage. And so, uh, two of the biggest stars from Vince McMahon's eighties, uh, trying to prove themselves in the cage. And that's going to be coming up later on, but you're right. Uh, this was a hell of an undercard for what came, became a silly ass main event, a two on eight main event. Scott Hall comes down the aisle here, down through the crowd on March 20 and I'm sorry, May 27th. Right. So you're talking two months and change and the business, at least for WCW is completely presented a different way. No, right. None of the, the silliness of the cage here. Let's talk about sort of behind the scenes here, what's going on uh, and how business is too, because you guys drew about 9,000 fans, only a hundred shy of capacity with 7,300 paying a gate of 104 grand. So for WCW in this era, that's really good money. Uh, by comparison, uncensored 95 was in the same building and only drew 5,700. So, uh, attendance is up, but the buy rate is down here. The buy rate for uncensored 95 did a 0.96. This was not as attractive, only doing a 0.8. And we covered uncensored 95 before Tony. And I think a lot of the intrigue about, Hey, what is uncensored? What does it mean? Maybe the name of the show didn't live up to the hype in 95. And some people were a little less willing to shell it out. Or maybe it was about the Hulk Hogan silliness of the main event. Why do you think the buy rate was down here overall? If you had to guess, Tony, uh, my, my thing was my, uh, had to get, if I had a guess, and, and I really, th- I, I, I believe this, this is a common thread that I've talked about throughout all these shows. I think that gradually our focus went away from pay-per-views into WCW Monday Nitro. And I think the more popular the Nitro became and the more established that Nitro became on Monday night, the more people thought, I can just watch uh, Nitro and get my fill of great WCW wrestling and not have to buy this stuff. That's my thought on that. Right. Maybe wrong, but I, I really, really think so. I, I'd be interested to see that in the context of what is going on today, uh, you can uh, subscribe to the WWE Network and get all their pay-per-views. If they did not have a WWE Network, how would their buy rates be with all that they're showing and giving away on Raw and, Raw and SmackDown? I, I, that'd be interesting to to, to look into. I, I don't know the numbers of that, and I'm sure that Meltzer reports on it, but it, it's hard to get a buy rate number. When you've got so many subscribers to the network. So anyway, I, I, I go back to the old school stuff that, you know, you, uh, you gotta, uh, you gotta, uh, tease them to the pay-per-views and not give them everything away on WCW Nitro. We're even going to, well, great counter move that time by Conan. We are going to, uh, even here talk about Nitro and talk about a big main event coming up at WCW Monday Nitro as it pertains to this show here. Well, Conan is, you know, uh, again, 
you just you, you know that Eddie can do a lot of stuff, but Conan can too, man. He was just uh, I thought Conan was underutilized many times. That sequence we just saw there was reminiscent of something you might have seen in ECW, where the guys are working real fast, trying to outdo one another, and then nobody can sort of get the upper hand, and they stop and just sort of come to a face off. In an ECW, that would get a standing round of applause, a standing ovation for their performance right. here in Mississippi. You had four people clap, right? I, you know, and I don't know that that's necessarily saying that these guys aren't putting on a good match so much as maybe it's not the right one for this audience. This Mississippi audience is probably a little more old school Southern wrestling. And you can see Conan sort of shift gears here. Like, you know what? They weren't buying that let's switch. And he's trying to sort of play to the crowd and get fans chanting. And now Eddie Guerrero sort of selling against it on the other side, right? Shows the the true mark of a professional to me where they're trying things and you sort of got to, if you're going to call it in the ring, you sort of shift gears based on, Hey, what are they buying? Right? Tony? Yeah, that, that you're exactly right. And, and Conan certainly who was a great performer, uh, in the United States and Mexico was certainly, uh, you know, did more than just wrestle in Mexico. Uh, and was very uh, instrumental in their success there. One thing that uh, that I think, in, in, compared to crowds here, don't you think that, and I've been doing a lot with Major League Wrestling now, that the old ECW crowds, we can call them, if you'd like, smart crowds, they have now become crowds for independent wrestling. And there's more crowds like the ECW crowds that used to be all over the country now than there are crowds like we're seeing here in Tupelo, don't you think? No, I would agree. I think, you know, with, uh, the internet being what it is, you have a much smarter fan and, you know, these days people know who's negotiating with who and who failed the drug test and who's going to what promotion and whose contract expired. And, and at this point in the crowd, they probably think that Conan is, you know, a colorful masked man. They don't know he's the Mexican Hulk Hogan and they they certainly don't know about Gravitron. Right. Right. (laughs) Absolutely. They don't, but they're being entertained here. I I would at least I'm entertained by what we're seeing in in a great matchup to open things up. You know, it, it amazes me. And and I, I'll, I'll bring this up right now. Uh, two of the three people in the ring are, have passed away right now. Right. When we go on camera, two of the three people on camera, Tony, Dusty, and Brain, have passed away right now. It's just amazing how time goes by and we lose such wonderful people in the wrestling business. I guess it's like any other business, Conrad, any other uh, part of entertainment, but it just, I, I was struck by the, the, uh, the fact that, you know, uh, how many people have, have since gone on that were a part of the show. And shout out to Conan, who's just recently had a, a hip replacement and had a little stint in the hospital just to make sure that he's good to go. And I think he's going to be doing some rehab for a while, but I think he's on the mend and feeling better. He'd been hurting for a long time. So, uh, glad to hear that he's uh, on the mend and doing better. Yeah. Well, he keeps it 100%. Uh, as we say, I love that you're like the whitest dude ever. He keeps it 100%. <laughs> of course you're referencing his uh, podcast, which you yeah. should check out if you're enjoying ours, keep it at 100 or as Tony he- says, Keeping it 100%. <laughs> well, I can't deny that I'm as square as they come. Yay. Hey, Hulk Hogan fans are in the ring and they're also getting into to, uh, Eddie and Conan here a little bit as well. We got a little feedback on our Gravitron conversation last week with Eddie Guerrero. Yeah. And a lot of people were wondering, was I going to start calling Eddie Guerrero Gravitron? And was that disrespectful? And I say, nay, nay, first of all, we give a really fun explanation, you know, as to why maybe that made sense. But also, you know, let's not forget it is a bit of a family tradition because Hector Guerrero was laser Tron. Yes, so, it was. So by gosh, I think, uh, Eddie being called, um, Gravitron for the next week or so on our show, that ought to be fine. I, I would absolutely agree. And you know what? I loved laser Tron. And you know, we didn't have one comment from anyone who had ever been to the state fair and actually ridden the Gravitron who didn't absolutely love it. So right. You know, if you love, if you love, uh, fair rides, then you love yeah. Gravitron. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen Gravitron many times. I wasn't going to get on it, man. That, 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 that shit's dangerous. Well, you wouldn't want to sign up for a Gory Guerrero special either. Right? <laughs> no, I, I would not. That shit's dangerous. So <laughs> as we take a look at the 
Uh, what's it called the again? The Doomsday Cage. <laughs> I keep, I keep it one to call the Triple Tower of Doom. Well, that's or, fine. We rename uh, that bullshit. Okay, I, like I just, you... I keep thinking of the ride at, at uh, Disney. Oh yeah, yeah, the Hollywood uh, Studios where it like goes to the top and then falls. Yes. Then falls. The yeah. elevator gimmick. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's not for me. Not my favorite ride. Really? Yeah. Not for me. Oh, <laughs> you like Gravitron at the fair. But you don't like the triple tower of terror at Disney. Well, in fairness, I liked it as a kid. I'm not saying uh, if Gravitron came to my town today, I'd want to ride it. Yeah. Oh, you, you've, you've grown up so much, Conrad, in, in the time that I've known you. You were just a kid when we started the show, and now look at you. Now, I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm getting fucking married now, Tony. I got to think about the future, you know? I know. And I know, I know if I go to the state fair, I know if I get on that Gravitron, I'm coming out with hepatitis. You know what I mean? <laughs> I got to think about the kids, man. Got to think yeah. about the kids. Yeah, you certainly do. You certainly do. And, uh, I can't wait. I know I've got a wedding coming up and, and you're going to be there and I'm excited about that. And I'm going to be at your wedding. Uh, and, uh, Hey, real question. Uh, do uh -huh. I need to come to your, uh, shindig? Do I need to come to your general area the day before or early the day of, you know what my travel time is and what time I need to be there? What would be advisable? Well, uh, the, what would be advisable, I, I think, is, and you've got a lot of people, a lot of friends in the metro Atlanta area that you can you can hang out with if you like. I would come in. Uh, I would come in the day before. What a fucking spot from Andy Guerrero there, yeah. um, coming off the top rope down to the floor on Conan. It's not necessarily a, a big high spot now, but twenty two years ago, man, that was a smoking move. Yeah, and you can see the old school Southern wrestling fans. Are kind of getting into this right now after that. And, and, and again, it just shows, I, I go back to this great performers. Even if the, you come to the ring and the fans say, yeah, you know what? I don't give a shit about this match. Great performers will bring the fans into the match. And that's what we've seen so many times with Eddie. And now here with Eddie and Conan. This is, um, one of the things that was really setting WCW apart at the time is the international talent. You know, a week prior to this, you guys crowned a cruiserweight champion, uh, with Otani beating Benoit in the finals of a tournament to become the cruiserweight champion. And now you're opening here with a bat with a match for your United States title, but it's with two Mexican performers and, and top guys in Mexico. Of course, Eddie Guerrero is fresh off a run with ECW where he got a lot of uh, buzz from the smart fans. And as you said, Conan's the Mexican Hulk Hogan. WCW, I mean, WCW is really setting the, uh, the pace here and the standard because on the other channel, we've got all kinds of silly shit with the WWF in this era. You know, also there was, and Kevin Sullivan was the main booker here at this time. There was a lot of people in the back that felt that we were doing the United States title, a disservice by having it, as they say, the curtain jerker. Right. In other words, there's a lot of old school people that feel if, if you're going to make your United States title prestigious, you need to, you know, the old thing was you have in, in the, in the old, uh, in the old scheme of things, there would be matches. There would be the, uh, uh, there would be the intermission. Then it would be the triple main event, which would be the tag team championship, the United States title, the world title. A lot of people held on to that. And felt that making the U.S. title the first match was the wrong thing to do. But I don't think there was any problem with that because of the performers. And you wanted to start out the show hot. I, you know, to me, you would want to be, if I mean, I'm not a wrestler. What the fuck do I know? But you'd want to be in the main event. But if you can't be in the main event, on a big show like this, not a house show, but on a right. big show like this, a pay-per-view, um, a television show, I wouldn't. I would love to be in that first match. Yeah, sure. It was a cover by Conan, but not only that, it's something I've brought up many times. And, you know, I always thought I was an advocate of every match meaning something. And if that was the case, shouldn't every match on a pay-per-view be a main event in its own? I agree. And you know, it's funny too, because I think the business has changed a little bit in that regard, because now if you're in, in that change out changeover from one hour to the next with the way ratings are looked at. <clears throat> You can tell who the company has a lot of faith and confidence in. Yeah. yeah exactly. You know, I mean, if it's the, uh, you know, I'm here in Alabama, if you open the show at seven o'clock, it's going to be stars. 
If you want to flip over at eight o'clock, it's going to be stars. You want to flip over at nine o'clock, it's going to be stars. And then when they're going off at 10, it's going to be stars. Those are the important times. So I think in time, some of that, you don't want to be quote unquote, the curtain jerker has changed a little bit because of television and the influence of ratings. It used to be back then. And we're talking about back during the Monday night wars. And I don't, I don't know anything about how they, how they meter ratings or take rating points now, but it used to be that. Top of the hour, quarter of the hour, bottom of the hour, 45, top of the hour were the times that you wanted to be on the air. I'm talking about Nitro now, Thunder, and have something hot and have a star because those were when the ratings points were taken, we were told. Suicide dive from Conan there just moments after uh, he pushed Eddie Guerrero from the top rope down to the floor. These guys are working hard. I don't know that the fans here in Mississippi are really digging it as much as maybe they should, but they're having a good match. They're having a good match. And, and I think we're, we've got a pretty darn good call on this. The, the uh, end of the match, uh, is, is going to kind of be fucked up. And, and the reason I say that, and I know we're getting close to the end of the match here. Uh, we were told to make sure that it was a low blow that ended up winning the match for Conan. And if you watch, it wasn't really a low blow. It was Eddie falling on the head of Conan hit him in the nuts, or as you would have said, head to the dick, head to the dick, that ended up uh, changing this match. And I'm not so sure that they either messed up on the spot or we were misinformed because I'm going to jump in here. And if you go back and listen to it, I'm going to jump in here and say, that was a low blow by Conan. And really, realistically, it wasn't. Look at this spot, man. Wow. I feel like I should mention here, this is not the first match that the crowd is seeing And maybe that's some of the reason they're not as hot for it as they could have been. They've seen three other matches before, I guess four actually, before they got here. Yeah. Um, they saw, uh, JL upset Dean Malenko and JL of course is Jerry Lynn. Really think about this card guys. I mean, how awesome is it? The first match they see here in March of 96 is Jerry Lynn and Dean Malenko. I mean, how do you follow that? Well, you bring out Jim Duggan and Bubba Rogers and they Mm -hmm. have the match. (laughs) After okay. that. <laughs> up and down and up and down we go. Right. And then Dick Slater wrestled mm. Alex, Wright. I want to say that again, <laughs> Dick Slater wrestled Alex, Wright. That feels like a match that nobody ever wanted to see, but it yeah. happened. And then your last match before the actual pay-per-view is the Steiner brothers going to a no contest with the nasty boys when the road warriors interfere. Oh, so, there's your, there's your finish right there. Head to the dick. Head to the dick. So what you're saying is, right, The and, and here comes your cover and your one, two, and three, and Kodan's going to win. What you're saying is the, the fans, Conrad, are kind of spent by the time this match starts. I think so. I mean, yeah. you know, as, as hot of a match as this was, and I really enjoyed it, and by the way, the dirt sheet did too. You know, these guys wound up earning a rating in the newsletter of three and a quarter stars. And they said the only negative thing about doing the low blow finish was that they did about 30 low blows the rest of the show without any leading to a pin. But maybe that's because, you know, Gravitron had, you know, herpes. And when you really punch the herpes, (laughs) that's it. You know, I mean, it's devastating. Where'd you come up with that shit? Well, we (laughs) talked about it last week that he had, you know, crystal meth, some magic candy, and (laughs) he wanted to give that to your mom and some herpes now, not him personally, just his mustache and his mullet, his, his look at the fair at the fair. <laughs> well, he didn't want to shake hands with Conan because, Hey man, you, uh, you, a low blow there, motherfucker. Uh, and we're going to take a look once again, see, there was really, no, he just fell on his head to the dick, head to the dick. Let me tell you this though. You know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't an intentional low blow. Of course. Yeah. Uh, total accident, but I thought that was a cool finish and I realize I'm in the minority, but it comes off as real. And, and speaking of coming off as real, I think you've got your work cut out for you here, Tony. I'm going to let you take it away. Thank you very much, Tony Shivani. And here we go. Uh, keep your pants on Colonel Parker, put that back in your pants. I'll be talking to you here just a little bit later, but I want to talk a little bit here about the WCW uh, hotline and how you can also join us online. Let's take a look at the giant right now who is surfing porn with CompuServe. That's right. You don't see it, but he's got one hand on the computer and one hand on his roll of baloney. But you can type go convention and 
make him stop surfing porn right now. Ooh, push that button. WCW World Championship Wrestling Online. You can't beat it. Now, let's bring in Colonel Robert Parker. Come on in here. He's uh, zipped up his pants. Dick Slater, I don't know what the fuck you're doing here, but we'll bring him in as well. Uh, Colonel Parker, coming up, you've got a match against Medusa. That's right. It's a man versus woman match, and you know she is the favorite, let me say this, of Tony Schiavone. So what do you got to say about that? <laughs> let me tell you something, Gene. I don't give a shit who Tony Schiavone likes. I know she's a tough broad, but I'm going to what I'm going to do here with Dick Slade at my side about 15 minutes into the match. If it goes 15 minutes, Dick, you're going to see something that you've never seen before because I'm going to let my jump rope slip out from the side of my tights. Your jump rope from the side of your tights. That's right. The jump rope from the side of my tights. And then everybody's going to be looking at that. It's going to be from one corner to the other. I'm going to look up at Medusa. I'm going to say, don't pay attention to that. And I'm going to roll her up, and I'm going to get the pin. I'm going to roll her face right into the mat. That's exactly right. So let me say, Shivani, you may like this woman, but I'm in it for myself. I'm in it because I'm Colonel Robert Parker, and I'm going to be a manager for a long, long time. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be the manager of the Dirty Blondes in Major League Wrestling. Dick Slater, what the fuck are you doing here? I don't know, Gene, what I'm doing here. Colonel Barker, good to see you. But you notice that I never look at the camera. I've never looked at the camera for any interviews. I always look down and look at myself in the monitor. But I'm looking forward to seeing the jump rope come alive, Colonel Barker. Come alive. The jump rope, when's it going to come out? Well, you motherfucker, it'll come out when I say it's going to come out. Don't put your hands on it because I'm a sensitive man. The jump rope's coming out, and I'm going to beat Medusa. Once and for all. All right. There you got it. Colonel Robert Parker and the Jump Rope Academy going up against Medusa. Let's send it back to the ring. Tony, I love you. I, I think it was something like that. I'm not sure, but I'm just doing that by memory. Well, it was uh, great. I'm not sure. I okay. really appreciate it. No problem. Ah, man, I got my work cut out for me <laughs> in these fucking interviews today. Let me tell you, this is uh, going to be a match that we have talked about for a long time. And I don't think you yeah. ever pinpointed that it was uncensored 96, but here yeah. we are. It's one of your favorite matches of all time. It's Steve Regal. Yeah. It's fit Finley, right? It is a match that I remember maybe as much as any match I've ever done in WCW. Now you see Jeeves coming out with him. Do you know who Jeeves is? I think, inside stuff? I think it's Bill Dundee. No, it's not. This is Wildcat Willie. Oh, you know, the, okay. Yeah, this is the guy who was in the Wildcat Willie uniform, and they put him as Jeeves to come out with. Uh, Wait, wh uh, which with, one did with, Bill Dundee play? What was his character? Uh, Sir William. There you go. Yeah, Sir William. And this was Jeeves. And, and the only thing they had Wildcat Willie come out and just come out and then walk away. He didn't get involved, you know, because I think he was shitting in his I pants. need you and, to describe this Belfast bruiser look that fits mm -hmm. rocking here with a half studded leather jacket and a half silver shoulder pad with a yeah. mustache and a skullet <laughs> slaps a wildcat. Willie and actually slapped him at times. So Jeeve says, fuck it. I'm out of here. Uh, the thing about the bill fast bruiser and fit Finley was here's the deal. Don't fuck with this guy. I I'm serious. Don't fuck with this. And from right there, we knew the shit was on. Uh, and here we've got two guys who are very good friends, two guys who certainly uh, love each other a great deal. And they decided, Conrad, before this match, that they were going to go out. I don't know if uh, Strong Style would even describe this. I would, I would say this is a work shoot or maybe a shoot work because everything is fucking stiff in this match. And there's going to be a moment, and I will point it out, when this match comes along, here's a cover, when this match comes along where Fit Finley actually crack the orbital socket of the eye of Steve Regal. It's going to happen here. And this was a match where after the night was over, Regal was still in the back and he said, mate, how did that look? And that eye was swollen shut. And I said, you know, you and fit Finley are fucked in the head. I mean, what, what, you know, he said, well, we wanted to make it look real. I said, motherfucker, you did. And just some of these blows are just every, everything is, Everything is real. I, they, they did not. They may have watched again. This is about the fourth time I watch it. They may have pulled some punches, but I didn't see anything pulled. 
it's a great match. It's it's underrated. Nobody really talks about it. They're yeah. going to go about 17 and a half minutes and you actually get praised. Of course, Meltzer took you to task in the last episode and mm. or the last match and didn't really dig what you were doing, but here he makes it a point to say Tony Schiavone made a comeback on this match as he got it over as being brutal, even though a lot of what was taking place would go over the heads of many, if not most of the viewers. This was a super stiff, all Japan impact type of match with no hot moves, no build or psychology and a horrible finish. It really wasn't an entertaining match, but on a believability scale, it was more believable than almost anything you would ever see in the U S short of a UFC match. And it was even more brutal than most of those. Not that this is a match of the year, but it is indeed a must see match. The two who have wrestled against each other for years, just pounded the crap out of each other. Finley's offense was the most believable in North America. At one point, Bruiser threw a punch to Regal's nose, which broke his nose and pretty well messed up his face. And he may be needing surgery. Regal was bleeding from the nose heavily when Bobby Eaton and David Taylor interfered for the DQ. After the match, Taylor slapped Finley incredibly hard, three and a quarter stars. So he's sort of all over the place with the review, but sells everybody, man, it's must see and gives it three and a quarter stars. And I got to tell you, the fans here in Mississippi, even though he's saying they don't get it, they get two guys beating the shit out of each other, don't they, Tony? Yeah, they, I don't understand him saying that it is not an overall entertaining match. I'm, I was entertained. I was. They entertained the fuck out of me on this one. I, I, I just thought he was absolutely tremendous. And again, you know, uh, throughout the course of us doing this show, I've got a lot of heat from a lot of slap dicks who said Shivani doesn't remember much. I remember this match, and I also remember that it wasn't necessarily a broken nose that happened. It was, again, a, what I was told, a crack orbital socket that also smashed the nose and maybe broke the nose as well. But his eye was swollen shut, and that's because he got punched in it by, by Fit Finley. Everything here is, look at this. See what they do? They do things like put an arm bar on, crank the arm bar, and slap him in the face to boot. Or they do a pin and they take the forearm and they push it across and rub it across the face. It was just uh, one of my favorite matches of all time. Absolutely. And of course, it, it says a lot about uh, it says a lot about the ability of both men. Uh, it, it really does. And you know, Regal, as we know, as maybe many of you fans don't know, is is one of the higher ups in NXT. A trainer runs the uh, Performance Center, and they've got a man. Uh, Look at that. How about Regal throwing a drop kick? But not only throwing a drop kick, a stiff drop kick, buddy. Both feet in the face. And look at this. There he's driving the, the forearm down along the I love that. Here do it again, man. So he's one of the top uh trainers, I guess, of NXT. And they got a they got a good man because I mean Regal was just absolutely sensational. Is Fit Finley still a uh an agent? Yeah, he's still with the company as well. Both okay. of these guys who are sort of executives for the WWE now, and it feels like they're from the same era, but believe it or not, William Regal's only 49 years old. Wow. Uh, Finley is 60. So Finley is 11 years older than him here. Wow. Also, we just saw a shot of the Spanish announced team. How about that? We were the forerunner of that. That was Pedro Morales and Miguel Alonso, along with Conan and our Spanish announced table. Pedro, one of the real good guys. I want to mention here that. You know, this, this show really gets slept on, but it's, it's going head to head, you know, not really head to head, but it's in the same month as WrestleMania. So you guys are trying to pull out all the big guns you can here and all the big attractions a week later, we would see WrestleMania 12 with Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart on top. Uh, of course, the undertaker would work with diesel there. The ultimate warrior would return to take on Hunter Hearst Helmsley. We had the memorable Hollywood backlot brawl with Roddy Piper and gold dust. Tony, in this era, did any of you guys get together and sort of go over to somebody's house or something like that and watch WrestleMania? Nope. If it did, I was not invited. You know, as you probably know, Conrad, I don't have many friends, right? Uh, not because I'm not a nice guy, just because I kind of stated myself, but no, I, I, we, I, no, I didn't care. I, I didn't give a damn of what, what was on WrestleMania. Maybe I should have. I, I think it's something. Look at this, man. Just freaking put your knees on his shoulders and hammer the fuck out of him. <laughs> and then put your shin across his throat. Uh, maybe I should have. I, I brought that up before. Maybe I would have been more in tuned and could have been a better announcer if I watched the competition 
to see what they were doing. But I did not. I always thought the only way I can get better is just by watching myself back again, which I hate to do, but I did, and listening to what we did and try to make it even better from there, not listening or doing anything they were doing with the WWF. Long answer, I know, but that's the truth. Uh, Dusty mispronounced Regal's uh, second, Jeeves. Instead of calling him Jeeves, he calls him Chives. Chives, right. Yeah. Which I think is uh, pretty D- funny. Yeah, Dusty just loved to mispronounce stuff. Uh, and, 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 you know, and he was very good at it. Oh, look at that. We're going to see, uh, uh, again, if, if you're, if you got the sound down, you're listening to us. Thank you very much for doing that. We've had a lot of fun doing this throughout this, uh, year and a half we've been doing this podcast, but I also want to say this, uh, that it, it would behoove you to go back on the network again and maybe watch this. If, if Meltzer, uh, you know, praise my commentary, you know, who gives a fuck, but if he praised my commentary, you know, it may be worth it. I'm going to tell you to go back and watch the man versus woman match with the regular commentary and listen to dusty Rhodes and that I, I sent you a text during the week and I said, I laughed till I cried. And I did, you know, it it's, it's sort of funny. Cause we did talk about that off mic this week. And my point was, I feel like at the time, a lot of wrestling fans and wrestling journalists didn't really get dusty Rhodes and Bobby Heenan. I think a lot of people were expecting them to take things a little too seriously. And those guys were trying to have fun and trying to entertain you. And if you can go back and not be so caught up in the silliness of some of these storylines and trying to hope that they're being presented as real and instead just say, Hey, did they entertain me? Well, the answer is fuck. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And in other words, uh, I can shorten up what you're trying to say there. Conrad is Dave Meltzer, get your head out of your ass. I don't even know that it's necessarily that. I mean, you read some of the newsletters during that time and, um, some of the, the letters to the editor where subscribers would write in and they would really just dump on dusty roads as a commentator. Uh-huh. But how much fun have we had just on these podcasts that we've done together talking about how hilarious some of his commentary was. And in the end, you know, this is entertainment and yeah. yes, you do want occasionally your product to be presented as real and violent and you know, all those other descriptors, but one of them is, Hey, I, I want to laugh. I want to be amused. I want to be entertained and being entertained. Isn't always selling a drama. Sometimes right. it's comedy. Well, everybody has their own opinion. I understand that. Put it this way. When you're writing a newsletter, you decide what letters reaction goes in the newsletter, right? Well, no, I get that. But I guess what I'm saying yeah. is like, how seriously are we really going to take Colonel Robert Parker wrestling Medusa? Right. Like right. I'm sure they're very, I know they're both, both very capable performers. And when they're, they're in something with their own sex, I get it. What a fucking maneuver there. Oh. Uh, we're talking over a tremendous match and I really don't want to make fun of this. You have got to go out of your way to see it. The, the elbow that cactus Jack runs and, and jumps off the side with and throws the elbow to the floor. Steve Regal just did that. And he did it after a series of these guys trying to suplex each other, either into the ring or to the floor. And in all my years of wrestling, I can count on one hand, the number of times that the guy, instead of taking the bump in the ring, the guy on the apron actually gets the guy in the ring out to the floor. And it just happened here, Tony. Yeah. And after he put the elbow on him, what did he do? He hit him in the face as he had him down just for added, uh, oomph, I guess. Uh, and we're going to be getting close here to, uh, uh, Regal getting his, uh, eye socket cracked, uh, and his nose broken, I guess. Uh, and it's going to happen here on the outside, but, but again, they just, they are absolutely relentless with each other, uh, in this match and they're, they're doing things. See Regal, see, he puts him in a side headlock. So what does he do? He pounds him in the head and the Belfast Bruiser get out of it. What does he do? He rakes him in the nose. That's right. They're doing things that in a real fight you would try to do to get out of this shit. And I, and I think that's one of the things that made this match so intriguing. And I'm watching this thinking, now I know these guys, how much they uh, admire and uh, respect each other, but what the fuck am I watching here? You know, and are they really mad at each other? Uh, and then again, you know, realizing that I know these two, uh, just absolutely amazing. Have you, um, have you been able to catch any of fit Finley's son? He's actually wrestling in new Japan. Now, did you know that I did not? What does he go by? I may have, he goes by David Finley. Okay. And, uh, he's followed in his dad's footsteps and he's actually, I think he lives in Atlanta, 
but he yeah. also obviously spends a lot of time over in Japan as well, but uh, he's with new Japan and he was only born like three years before this match. So it's kind of cool to know as you watch this back that, uh, fit has a three-year-old at home who has no idea what's going on. And now he's probably working these style matches in Japan as we talk. Yeah. It's, it's just, uh, uh, well, like father, like son, right? Absolutely. So and it's good to see. And, you know, my involvement in major league wrestling has given me a greater appreciation for wrestling outside of the WWE, new Japan, if you will, independent wrestling. You know, I, I follow that a lot more now and we get to see a lot of guys who've been on the independent circuit and, and wrestle around. So I have a, I have a profound appreciation for it. Although it's very apparent that what I remember in pro wrestling and what is out there today are two completely different things. The crowd here goes silent for a little piece. Yeah. Uh, and they're not really reacting to much. And dusty says something like, boy, I tell you what, they have wore each other down. They have beat and pounded and wore each other down. And then you made some sort of comment, like they've worn this crowd down as well. They don't know what to think of this. The, this yeah. crowd is stunned. This is one of the most vicious fights any of us have ever seen in our lives. So I thought it was you doing a good job of trying to cover up that. Hey, for whatever reason, uh, this Mississippi crowd is not really popping for this, but I still, I still go back to, you know, this is a, a Southern wrestling crowd. And you've already had Jim Duggan and Bubba Rogers and Dick Slater. And oh, by the way, I think this ruined it. Maybe the Steiner brothers, the nasty boys and, and the road warriors. And so if you've got that, and then you come to these guys, maybe they think, well, what the fuck are we doing now? Without really appreciating, Hey, the road warrior run in shit was three minutes. These guys are going to work their ass off and have a really high level competitive match. But maybe because they weren't on Vince's TV for 10 years, they don't care as much. Right. Exactly. And, uh, so what do they do? They just went out and, and beat the fuck out of each other. They did. Look at this. They just, that we're just, you know, we're good friends. We've been in this business a long time. We know what we're doing. Uh, and we're just gonna beat the shit out of each other. And we're not only, we're going to make it look real. It's going to be real. And that's exactly what they had. It's like, uh, you know, Ric Flair said only 30 for 30, you know, uh, it's not fake. It's choreographed. Uh, this, I'm not so sure this was choreographed. Uh, this was, uh, just, you know, <laughs> see, he tries to get up. He just sledgehammers him back down. I mean, you just, they did things that you normally didn't see in a match because they were doing things that were, that you, again, absolutely were real in a real fight. See, grab his hair and pull him over. You know, I, I, I think more, I think more wrestlers, even today, the young kids should look at this match and, and maybe there's here we go. Now the, the, here's where we're going to get to the spot, uh, where Regal uh, gets his nose and, or, uh, eye socket cracked. Uh, and it's not going to happen right here. It's going to happen when Regal gets back into the ring and, and leans over fit Finley. So I want everyone to watch this closely because here's when the spot comes up. Finley is down. And what do you do if someone hovers over you? Regal's going to hover over him right now. Boom, right there. There it was. It's fun a, because uh, immediately Finley looks at his left fist. Yeah. Like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. And Regal's like, holy shit. Holy shit. And even Nick Patrick knows what's going on here. Patrick's looking over like, oh, shit. You're hurting here, buddy. Yeah, he is. And that, I don't think it changed the complexion of the match, but... There you see the left eye is kind of uh, is kind of bloody right now. The nose is going to start bleeding, and uh, true to form, because we being Turner Broadcasting pussies, we are going to pull off on it. Uh, because when the blood, so he just hammers him again in the other side of the head. Uh, we're going to pull off on it because of all the blood that starts to come down from Steve Regal. There you see the blood, and now we notice the blood, and now basically we're going to be on this shot most of the time. I mean, uh, do you think that's, you know, obviously the, the practice was probably outlawed or banned by Turner. And this is a, a, a decision that comes from even higher than Eric Bischoff, but right. this really, to me, doesn't make any sense. We're on fucking pay-per-view, you know, exactly, exactly. They paid for it. You know what? As announcers, we could have said, fuck on there. We'd have had, it's not broadcast TV. It's kind of the, it's kind of the equivalent of HBO now. 
So uh, they pull back from it. Regal is bleeding profusely. Uh, as a matter of fact, he's bleeding from the nose. He had his right eye uh, socket cracked. Uh, his left eye has now uh, also been hammered by Fit Finley, and Finley's going to take him to task. And the fans, you can see at ringside, are all of a sudden realizing what's going on here, that th this is a real fight. Oh, like over the top he goes and right to the floor. And Nick Patrick says the match will continue, I guess. I'll drink to that. Yeah, you're not kidding. Keep it going on, man. Let, let them fight. And again, we got to get on the wide shot because the fight's going to take uh, on the floor. And Regal, I, I, it amazed me that Regal, once he, I mean, he's got to be in a in a in a tremendous amount of pain here. But he he gets his second wind, and he is back to the attack once again. And look at Regal, <laughs> hand behind him, and the sign, the peace sign, uh, from Winston Churchill. Oh God, I love Steve Regal. Oh, man, one of the great performers ever. And here comes now the Blue Bloods. Uh, yes, uh, that is David Taylor, and also that is Bobby Eaton from that uh, great English town called Huntsville, Alabama in the U.K. It's amazing to me that we see Bobby Eaton in the suit here. I feel like yeah. this is like, uh, I don't know, is Bobby Eaton a pallbearer? Is he here to sell me term life insurance? <laughs> Bobby Eaton in the suit's throwing me off. Yeah, but he's one of the blue bloods with Lord Stephen Regal. Oh, <laughs> he got cold cock that time. Did Finley has one parting shot <laughs> that time from Steve Regal in the matches with uh, Finley's making sure he's got teeth. Oh my God, what what a fucking great match, gang! Uh, makes you makes you love the product again. It really really does. It makes you love the product. So what is he going to do? He's going to run back and then watch him nail David Taylor. Boom! <laughs> and that's it. Woo! It's over. That was a fun uh, time, but if you enjoyed that, I think you're in for a real treat with what we've got coming up next here. Yeah, what we got coming up next here? Uh, I'm not so sure what we got coming up next, Just but as we get ready here, Tony, you're going to have right. fun with this. That's, all right. All right. Absolutely. It's a wide shot here, and I do believe we're going to go back to Gene Oakland. Thanks a lot, Tony Shivani. Yes, we're back in here with the Giant. Uh, over seven feet tall. And one thing that I know for sure, and John, I want to talk to you about this in just a moment. You have been known to take a big shit in our dressing room. Jimmy Hart, t tell me about what he's been doing in our dressing room. Well, let me tell you something, Mean Gene. I go in there with the toilet paper and I say, Paul, push a big turd out of your ass and make sure that Shivani sees it. Make sure that Heenan sees it. Make sure that Dusty sees it and make sure that mean Gene Okerlund sees it as well. Shit in there. All right. Well, today I looked in the toilet and I saw something that big. Giant, what the fuck are you doing and why are you doing this? Because you are a giant, but your turds are giant as well. Coming up, you've got the Loch Ness Monster. Well, Gene, I'm not worried about the Loch Ness Monster because I heard that he is so fat. And so big that he cannot even wipe his own ass. I can wipe my ass. And I've wiped my ass many times. I've wiped my ass on toilet paper and I left it on the floor. Along with a gigantic turd in the commode of the announcer's room. Because I am Paul White. And I, the son of Andre, shits the biggest turds in the world. So let me tell you this, Loch Ness Monster. Maybe you haven't wiped your ass in about two weeks. But I'm going to wipe the mat up with you. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ. There you see it. One of us going to have to go back and flush the commode before this is over. Let's send it back to the ring. Oh, God, it stinks in this fucking place. And let's go back with more action in the ring. I'm going to miss me and Gene doing these yeah, promos I know. for us. It's, it's, all right, well, there you go. It was he, and it was, it was him. It was him shitting in our, our, our dressing room, and, yep. Yeah. Look, uh, Dusty's not any said about it. But, you know, here's the thing. He's big. He can shit wherever he wants. You've shit in many places before, haven't you? I mean, uh, you, uh, did you ever take a shit in our room? Uh, or did you fart? Well, I, I, I never did take a shit in the announcer's room, but I would go in there and I would pull down my pants and I would pull my jeans down. And, of course, I don't wear any underwear. And I would take big old farts and shut the door. As a matter of fact, when I see you near an urinal, I would go near you and I would take a big old fart 
that looked about as big as a trailer, and you would say, ooh, what the fuck was that? You see what I'm saying, Heenan? Uh, well, let me say this. Uh, Dusty's farts didn't stink anything like the giant shit. And speaking of stinking, Heenan, uh, let's talk about what we've seen so far. Well, we really haven't seen anything to stink. We have seen some badass matches, and we've seen some guys being laid out. We're getting ready to see now a couple of uh, a, a woman, Medusa, going at it against Colonel Robert Parker. I don't know who's going to win, but I know that Shivani, you and her, went out to dinner last night. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I mean, just, uh, what? What are you talking about? Uh, well, I think it's time for us to go to the ring. Uh, and uh, fuck this shit. Uh, let's go to the ring where man versus woman, Heenan, you and I will talk about this later. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a married man. <laughs> you may be a married man right now, you stupid son of a bitch, but that doesn't mean that uh, uh, that this marriage is going to last. And I've got some news on the WCW hotline about Tony Schiavone's date with Medusa last night. 1-900-909-9900. You know, we've talked about kids get your parents' permission. We have said, fuck that. Don't get your parents' permission. Here's another thing. Go into your room, lock the fucking door, let them pound on the door, and call from the phone. Well, that's just the way it is. Uh, that's the hotline, and that's how I make some of my money. Now, we just heard from the giant, and we know the giant was surfing porn, one 909 Now we're going to talk to the man who is his opponent tonight, over 700 pounds. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to talk here to the big Loch Ness Monster. I've never seen a guy this size this big, come on in here, big guy. I want to uh, talk about uh, what uh, Paul White just said about you not being able to wipe your ass. Uh, talk about it, uh, if you would, just a, a little bit here. Well, Gene, uh, I haven't seen my shoes or I've seen my penis in 15 years. That's right, 15 years. So, yeah, my hands may be small. Yeah, well, we understand they are. Yes, they're small. But here's the story about me and my ass. I cannot wipe my ass, so I just keep it the shit in the crack, my butt crack, for two weeks. And then my friends come down, and they take me out to the Tims with soap and corn cobs, and they have a Loch Ness Monster wash-up day. That's right, a wash-up day. And guess what? I haven't wiped my ass in two weeks, Paul White. So today, in this match, I hope I can do a gigantic splash on you. Let me uh, ask you something. Do you know you look like the uh, great grandfather of Conrad Thompson? I knew that. Well, th that may that may be so, but the fact is that I stink, and I'm fat, and I'm 700 pounds, and I haven't seen my penis. <laughs> oh well, uh, listen, Conrad is one of the great podcasters of all time, and you you kind of look just like him. Uh, let's uh, let's go. Uh, let, let's go. Uh, let's go back to uh, the ring to you, Tony Schiavone. Something like that. I got to tell you, I'm pretty, uh, excited to call this, you know, there's no way we can do justice to the original commentary, but we've got the man versus woman challenge here with Colonel Robert Parker and Medusa. We're going to do our best to entertain you here, but realistically guys, you got to go back and listen to the original commentary. It's yeah. hard to beat this. And here's your coworker rumored innuendo is that, uh, this Robert Parker character is, uh, been uh, doing some stuff with MLW recently. Yes, he's been the manager of the Hollywood Blondes. Uh, and, you know, Colonel Robert Parker, he's an old fuck right now. Uh, and uh, But he hasn't lost a step, man. Still looks the same. Still talks the same. I mean, just uh, Robert Fuller has, he's quite a performer. And we are also going to see uh, him and Medusa go up right here. He shakes the hand of Randy Anderson. We missed this one. He had a, he had a $100 bill stuck in his hand. And he was shaking Randy Anderson's hand and, and slipping him a, a a Benjamin, so to speak. And what we was, missed it. What was funny is you guys announced Colonel Robert Parker is weighing in at 197 pounds. Yeah, David Pinter did that. And we, yikes. Roll Tide Medusa. Um, this is about as Roll Tide as Roll Tide gets for 1996 and women in wrestling. Yeah. Uh, especially in yeah. WCW, Roll Tide. Yeah, and not only that, she and we we did our best to put it over here that she was a uh, one tough lady. And here's the good news, and and here's the good news that is for me, Medusa and I are still very good friends, and we still 
every week, hello, we still every week stay in touch with each other. Just how you doing, blah, blah, blah. I was down in Miami last week, and I asked her how she was doing, and she kind of responded. We will text back and forth, and uh, she has been a good friend of mine. So when I talk about her, it's it's tongue-in-cheek, but my affection for her is real. To have oh, a lot, we can tell. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I have a lot, and I have a lot of respect for Colonel Robert Parker. All right. Robert Parker and Medusa. Yeah, I like those stripes, don't you? Just saying, roll tide. Or go dogs to that. Oh, uh, God, you had me saying roll tie. What the fuck is wrong? Right. With I'm winning you over. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, a couple of good things happened in this match. I mean, uh, Robert Parker, you know, this is, uh, if you strip the, the, the comedic part of, of Robert Parker down, uh, they did, uh, they did a lot of great things here. Uh, because Medusa is, Medusa is ready, tough. Parker is, is a, you know, before he became a manager, was a great wrestler, and <laughs> they lock up, and they go back to the ring, and we're going to see Medusa pick him up and slam him. And like I told Medusa after the match, sweetheart, you can slam me anytime. Look at this. You know what's fun? I don't know that we've talked about this before, but there was a, an independent performer who did some hardcore matches, um, I don't know, probably 15 years ago, who called himself Sexy Eddie. Did you ever hear about this guy? No. Well, he did one of these tournament of deaths, which I've got to show you sometime. Uh, and he hit an artery and he sort of started flexing his muscle and the blood would squirt into his own mouth. It was as ridiculous as I'm saying, but what you would have enjoyed about sexy Eddie was he did like a stripper gimmick. And so he had on like leopard print, like almost like mankini wrestling bottoms and then knee pads. And they were like the old. Chippendale bow tie and he would wear pants out and then rip them off. But he would be introduced as something like 197 pounds plus five pounds of cock meat. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I hear Robert Parker coming out at 197 pounds, I keep waiting on you to yell plus five pounds of cock meat. <laughs> oh God. Of course, Medusa gets the big body slam and it's sort of fun with all the crazy, you know, this goes to show you, you know, know your audience, man. We've seen some tremendous moves, some tremendous battles and matches so far. And the crowd was sort of, eh, but when Medusa body slammed Colonel Robert Parker, it was like Hulk Hogan and Andre in Mississippi, brother. Yes, it was. Medusa did a great job here in that she kept her facial expressions light as if I'm having fun here tonight. It was, it was not really a big smile on her face, but it was kind of a shadow smile. And she'd say, you know what? I, I'm having fun. I, I'm, you're not expecting me to be able to, to win against a, a big bruiser like this. Uh, and uh, I thought that, ooh, I thought, ooh, I don't know what to say about that. I don't know what to say about that. I might get in trouble if I say much more about it. Tried the point of the elbow that time, and Deuce moves out of the way. Now, Dick Slater has made his appearance here. Uh, look at that double drop kick from the top of missile. Go get him, girl. Let's see if Do Colonel it. Robert Parker with dick in tow is too much for Medusa. <laughs> well, he promised us on that interview that something would slip out. And it may have just crawled down the leg of his pants right there. I'm talking about Dick Slater. What are you talking about? Okay. I was talking about Robert Parker. Look at this. Medusa to the top. Parker on yep. the floor. Big <laughs> splash. <laughs> Parker helped, uh, uh, Soften her blow that time. Well, so what she, has she, some, she has her own built-in crash pants. Yeah, she does. And she goes to uh, kick him in the ass a couple of times. Uh, and uh, here's the uh, whip in. And we're going to get to the finish here in just a minute. Look at this. Look, go, go German suplexing, man. A German yeah. suplex on six foot oh. seven Colonel <laughs> Robert Parker. Oh, one, two, and it should have been the finish. Motherfucking Dick Slater. Fucking my woman. There's a one, two, three. And Colonel Robert Parker steals the win off of Medusa. Liked it. Liked the finish. Liked everything about it. I loved it. It was cheap yep. and, and it was believable. You know, she right. does a, a really athletic move with the suplex there. Uh, and then he just rolls over and smothers her once Dick sort of trips her up. And, um, it turns out that Colonel Robert Parker and his Dick were just too much for Medusa. Yeah. I'm sure a Melcher nor Wade Keller liked it because you wouldn't see something like this in Japan. Uh, it gets a, one star. Yeah. Um, 
Those Mount, are, Mountser would write their rags. Yeah, their rags get one star as Parker well. was announced at 197 pounds, a weight he probably hasn't seen since early high school. He's a lot closer oh, to oh, 297. Oh, For what oh, it was, given the limitations of Parker's character, it was an entertaining match, although it would have been impossible for these two to have any kind of real match. Medusa couldn't even keep a straight face after her first arm drag. Parker wound up going for a slam, taking a few drop kicks off the ropes, and finally went up for a German suplex. Slater kicked Medusa's leg out of the bridge, and Parker rolled her over for the pin. One star. Uh-huh. I, and Colonel Robert Parker is probably legit, what, 6'5", six, 6'6"? Six, six. Yep. He's a tall dude. All right. I liked it. He didn't. Fuck him. All right. Now let's go back to you know, the one and only uh, Lee Marshall. That's right. I was the voice of Tony the Tiger, and let me say that, Michael Phelps, when you were smoking a bong in 2009, you cost me $1 million. That's right, $1 million, because Frosted Flakes and Kellogg's had a sponsorship with you, and you and I were going to do a lot of commercials together. But no, not you, motherfucker. You fucked it up, so I'm going to bring in the Road Warriors. And I'd like to ask Hawk or Animal here, if one of you guys will go to Michael Phelps' house and fuck him up. Let me tell you something, Lee Marshall. We're not here to fuck up Michael Phelps because he's a swimmer. We are here to fuck up the team of Sting and Booker T. And let me tell you one thing. We're going to work as heels here. A Chicago street fight. And after this is over, if you want us to fuck up Michael Phelps, we'll fuck up Michael Phelps. Right, Hawk? Tell him about it, Hawk. Me and Hawk. Go ahead, tell him. I've been waiting to talk for a long time, Lee Marshall. Let me tell you a couple of things. Don't oversell this interview. They're looking at us. They're not looking at you. Don't react when we talk. Just stare at me because I will take your medulla oblongata and stick it up the ass of Michael. I told you not to react like that. Stick it up the ass of Michael Phelps. He may have cost you $1 million, but Frosted Flakes has made plenty of money off of Little League Baseball as they are pri- they are going, taking young kids across the country, not even age 11 or 12, and selling Frosted Flakes and people watching them play baseball on TV. It's the biggest charade. It's the biggest con ever in all of television. And you may have been Tony the Tiger for a while, but we got to go. All right, there you hear it. From my favorite team, the Road Warriors. Coming up a little bit later on, a lot of excitement. How much time do I have? All right, we're ready to go. We're excited back here. And this interview has been great. Let's go to the ring. Your ability to time those out is pretty fucking incredible. You're professional, Mr. Shivani. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, uh, that, that is a, I, I did talk to Lee Marshall about that. Uh, and of course, uh, but no, here we go. Not recently. We, oh no, because Lee's passed away in 2014. Uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, but, uh, we are going to get ready here. I want to uh, tell everybody that, as you can see, I do have my wedding band on. I want to show my finger there. Yes. I'm going to. I'm going to fidget with a little bit just to remind Lois. Yeah, I love Medusa, but you're still we are still married. But let me say something. I went to the Shivani house back in uh, I think it was like 19 uh, let's see 1994, and we were Christmas Eve, and Lois Shivani uh, beat me in a beer chugging contest. What the fuck? Beat him in a beer chugging contest? What in the fuck? Dr- dream? You, you, you don't say shit like that on TV. You absolutely don't. You just drive on the point that you're the fucking man. Don't talk about Lois Shivani beating you in a beer chugging contest back in 1994. That was two years ago. You're the American dream. And what is she? Uh, don't answer that. Uh, I can answer that, uh, but I really don't want to. But I, what I want to talk about is our next event coming up. If you think this thing is a clusterfuck, ladies and gentlemen, our next pay-per-view is coming up and it's going to honor the past, present, and future of WCW and this is called, what was it called? Slamboree? Yep. Slamboree! And now from Turner Home Entertainment, another video that makes no fucking sense in the world. Let's bring all the job guys from the power plant. Talk on the microphone that's hanging down. Oh, there's Bobby Walker. There's a girl. Who is that? Oh, it is High Voltage. High Voltage is going to sell our next pay-per-view. What in the fuck is wrong with us? Slambery, the lethal lottery. If you buy it, you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I love you. Sometimes. Yeah, it sounds now, something like that. This okay. is 
the shit we've been waiting for boys and girls. Mm. We've had mm. one clinic after another, and then a comedy match. And now, well, <laughs> you know, what's coming. Yeah. This ain't Tully Blanchard and Magnum TA. Uh, I tell you that right now. But Diamond Dallas page. This looks like the cosplay version of Diamond Dallas page here. <laughs> like, doesn't this look like some kid dressing up on Halloween? Like DDP. This doesn't look like DDP. No, it does not, man. He's not as tan. He doesn't have as many tattoos. The hair looks different in this era. He's obviously lost quite a bit of weight and it's fascinating again, because we talk about how time's really a funny thing, you know, in January of 97, that's where DDP would give the diamond cutter to Scott hall on nitro in new Orleans. And his career took off after that. He had the feud of the year with macho man, but here in March of 96, DDP still trying to put it together. And it's because of shit like this. Look who his opponent is here, Tony, the man of a thousand names and none of them worth a shit. <laughs> Brutus, the fucking barber beefcake is strutting out like a mental patient as the <laughs> booty man. Look at this shit. What is he doing? Well, here's what he's doing in his defense. They gave him so many gimmicks with the exception of maybe the barber. None of them worked. But he tried to make the gimmick work. Look at the crowd. They're so confused. Like, that's not Brutus the Barber Beefcake, is it? Because no, he, he doesn't have scissors and he's just dancing like a fucking asshole. But he's got, if you'll notice, he's got his cheeks in his tights cut out to represent the booty man. I mean, who, who thinks of that, though? I mean, this still feels like it's one, you know, one of those Jim Hurd, the goddamn candy man. Yeah, this is like uh, Kevin Sullivan concoction, the booty man. Is what it was. And of course he had the booty babe is going to come out with him, uh, in, in a few moments as well. And all eyes were on Kimberly once she came out. All right. By the way, let me just say, when you see Kimberly and you see DDP, you know, one thing's for sure. <laughs> that motherfucker can sell. You know what I mean? <laughs> He's a hell of a salesman. Yes, he is. You know, I don't think people really knew that until DDP yoga, but I knew back here in 96, I was yeah. like, wait a minute. He's married to her. Yeah. Some, some bitch can sell. You damn right he can sell, or some of it's packing. One of the two, you never know. Eh, we're going to sell. Okay. Uh, you know what? He's uh, he's got a kind of a, uh, a millennial beard on right now, doesn't he? Kind of a uh, uh, Conrad Thompson slash millennial beard. What is a millennial beard? Well, it's it's the the beard that's fashionable with kids your age now. You know, everybody's got one. Chris Shivani's got one. Matt Shivani's got one. Wait, Tim Shivani's got one. You think I'm a fucking millennial? You're 36, aren't you? That's not a millennial. That's not a, what is a millennial then? I don't know, but it's not. Yeah, a, you're no. a millennial. You, no, you motherfuckers that. are millennials up till 40, right? No, I'm okay. not buying this. I'm not going right. to sit here and let you do this shit to me. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I just, I have a feeling. You, oh, come on, motherfucker. Motherfucker. Google says millennial started in 81. That's when I was born. I hate you. See, I know what millennials are because I had a house full of you motherfuckers up to the nineties. And now all of you can take a fucking Ike because it's just me and the big L and four I, I needed to be, I needed to be the generation before that. Would that be generation Y uh, or Z yes. or whatever? There was, X, the fuck? there was X, Y millennial. Ugh. And, and then there was the greatest generation. And that's where I was a part of. And that mm. was baby boomers. You see, it's hard for me to, what, it's hard work. For, hang on. Just. Just so I'm clear, you, you're right. you're embracing officially the greatest. Yes, the uh, gr greatest night in the history of our sport. Well, greatest uh, generation of our great, yeah, of our great country. Uh, when we're all gone, when all of the baby boomers are gone, you guys, you millennials, are fucked. No. Your country's fucked. Just thought I'd let you know. Back to the match we go, and here's the booty bar, Brutus, the fucking barber beefcake. You know, here's yeah. what's fun about Brutus is Brutus. Yeah you know, had worked the territories, uh, for a little while. So he had worked Dothan, Alabama, you know, so he knows what gets over in Tupelo. So he's running around the ring. Like it's 1985 trying to get the go booty go chance. Yeah. Like it's, you know, the rock and roll express, but this is what? just not, I mean, it's amazing to me that you had Dean Malenko and Dick Slater and the Steiner brothers, they're in the dark matches. Well, but uh, this horse shit. Why do you think this horse shit is in our match? I'll let you guess. Could it be that he was a very good friend of Hulk Hogan? And who's the other guy good friends with? Eric Bischoff. I'm just saying you got the two power brokers of the whole company 
and their BFFs are in a prime spot here. Right. I mean, unbelievable. So yeah. the storyline here is Kimberly has won $18 million in a bingo game mm. and DDP stole her money. And, uh, eventually we're going to see Kimberly come to the ring, which is kind of fun. And dusty says something like, I just spotted a ballerina. <laughs> The uh, booty man dancing dude is just unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I, wow. Paige really selling that shoulder bar. I think we all thought at this time. Now, of course, we all realized that Brutus, the barber beefcake or the booty man or, uh, yin yang or whatever we wanted to call him <clears throat> down the road, uh, was a friend of Hulk Hogan's. But I think we all thought friend of Eric Bischoff's be damn. I thought even back here that there was something special about Diamond Dallas Page. I, I really did. Because and, of the work ethic that you had heard about and you knew about and his attention yes, to detail yeah. with his character and all that. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, let, let's face it. You know, DDP is, uh, was, was not a 19 year old kid here. Yeah. The, there's a, a saying, of course, that there's no substitute for hard work and nobody's ever said that. DDP wasn't willing to outwork people, you know, I mean, he was going to put the time in, he was going to pay the attention to detail. And this is certainly in an era where a lot of the guys are here to do as little as possible, get paid as much as possible, drink some beers after the show. They're here to have a good time and they're going to call it in the ring. DDP was the antithesis of that. He's here to put in the extra time. He wants to come in early. He wants to stay late. Um, he wants to really, really pay attention to detail to be better and to improve. And obviously, you know, it paid off. He's in the hall of fame and this Jack off in the ring with him is not. <laughs> wow. wow. <clears throat> Those comments from the, the pod father himself, Conrad Thompson, you disagree. You think that their I approach to business was the same? Well, no, 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 no. I agree with everything you say, but I didn't call him a Jack off. You did. Oh, I did. He's Brutus, yeah. the fucking barber <laughs> beefcake. He's okay. a professional weed carrier for yeah. Hulk Hogan. And people are like, wow. well, he ain't in the fame. Well, because there's not a weed carrier hall of fame. <laughs> and if there was, he'd be, yeah. he'd be in it first round yeah. with Jimmy Hart. Yeah. You know, one thing about, uh, backstage area about Brutus, um, he wasn't that friendly. Well, you know, listen, we're having fun with him here on the show, but in real yeah. life, he's, he's super nice to everybody. If you have an opportunity to meet him in an autograph session, you should go, you know, right. uh, people have bad experiences with wrestlers, but lots of people have a nightmare story of something with Virgil or Vincent or whatever you want to call him. Nobody ever has a bad experience with Brutus Beefcake. He wants yeah. you to have a good time. He wants you to get your money's worth. He really mm -hmm. will express some interest in what you're saying and what your memories are very giving person at those events. So even though we're having fun with his character and sort of shitting on him, uh, we're trying to make you laugh in real life. Uh, he's probably a great guy. Kind of like me, wouldn't you say, Conor? Just Yeah, see, that's the reason I want to clarify, because before we started this podcast, a lot of wrestling fans thought you were like this bitter, sad sack of shit. And now they've yeah. listened to the show, they know that you are a bitter, sad sack of shit, but you're there, bitter, right. sad sack right. of shit. Well, I, I'm going to disagree with part of that. I, I'm, I'm not bitter, and I'm not sad, but I am a sack of shit. It was a joke. I mean, that's okay. what I'm saying, though. But people had okay. a, 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 a conception yeah. And, and maybe a, a misunderstanding of who you really are. Right. You had yeah. this, you know, the perception rather of Tony Schiavone was he's not friendly with fans. He doesn't want to talk about wrestling. He thinks it's all stupid. And, yeah. And people sort of have a different perception of Ed Leslie, the guy who's portraying these thousand horrible failed gimmicks, except for the one. Yeah. Right. And, and you know, he's a nice guy. He made a living in a business that entertained us. And maybe he wasn't your favorite at all times. But when I was a kid, Bruce, the fucking barber beefcake was over, man. Yeah, he was, he was and the big clippers and everything. And, uh, uh, yeah, uh, just, just like me, just, you know, I think anybody who I've called, uh, about our t-shirts at loisrules.com. Uh, and, uh, boy, I'm really making up time on these phone calls now, uh, knows how nice of a person I am. And I want to talk about it. I just walked away from it, tried to do something else. And Conrad Thompson pulled me back in. That's all right. I'm enjoying it now. I'm enjoying going back and looking at this stuff. I feel like I should mention here. This was not the original plan for this show. Do you remember the original match that was supposed to happen here? Tony? I do not. 
Mark Marrow was supposed to be here as Johnny B. Bad. He actually quit and signed a three year contract with the WWF just about right. uh, 10 or 12 days prior to this. He was supposed to be working DDP here, but when he quits, Booty Man is put into this spot. Meltzer would report the situation with Marrow and Bischoff turned into the major topic of discussion as he quit the company Monday morning and was then buried big time on the air by Bischoff. who made comments about bad, uh, blaming a woman for losing the television title saying he didn't feel up to showing uh, up for his rematch with Lex Luger. And finally saying that bad couldn't hang where the big boys play. And a lot of folks in WCW were claiming what Mero wanted Bischoff to sign was a paper that would guarantee Mero the amount of money offered to him for its entirety, which was rumored to be two years at $300,000. Should Mero suffer a serious injury in the ring while the sides were still negotiating a deal. And Mero told Bischoff in the discussion that he'd been negotiating with Titan and he had an offer on the table from them. And it was in some ways a better deal and wanted to know what the future plans were for him. Well, Bischoff refused to sign that paper. One thing leads to another and, um, Bischoff wound up asking Mero to finish up that night after putting Luger over. Mero refused to work the show until they had a written deal and reportedly told Bischoff that he hoped he was living on good terms after five years with the organization and Bischoff clarified, you're not living on good terms at all. Um, Hmm. the nasty boys weren't around too much longer. Uh, they were sort of playing hokey pokey with the company. Of course, we know they had an incident with Scott Hall, but it looked like Bischoff was maybe tired of the bullshit here. What do you remember about this Mark Marrow separation from WCW? Well, yeah, Eric was tired of the bullshit and, and Eric was, I, I think, and, and I remember in the discussions when Marrow said that he had been talking to Titan that really pissed Eric off. Right. I mean, really, really pissed Eric off because Eric was dead set at this point in his career with not only winning the war, but, you know, bringing Titan bringing the WWE down to its knees, bankrupting them. So when Mero brought that up, that really got things turned on the ugly manner. That I remember. I didn't remember it being around this this event uh, and being around this time. But let's say, you know what? Uh, oh, what the fuck? Messed up spot there. Um, it, it helped uh, make Sable a, a household word, didn't it, down the <laughs> Damn. It did. And, and yep. it's, it's clear why Bischoff is okay with maybe letting so the rough end drag a little bit because business is up. Uh, I want right. to mention here from March of 95 to March of 96, they go from an average attendance of 2040 to 3720. So you're talking about 82% more. Their average gate went from $19,640 to 38,480. So it's up 95%. They had no sold out shows in March of 95 and they're selling about 9% out in March of 96. But despite all those positive indicators, ratings are actually down a little bit from a 2.5 to a 2.4. You know, it's anybody's guess as to why that may be. We've certainly had our theories over the years, but business is up and uh, it becomes apparent here. Maybe with him understanding he's got some new talent coming in that, Hey, you know what? If I'm bringing in razor Ramon and diesel, they can sure as fuck have Johnny B bad. Go, yep. make, go, go do your deal. Right. Yeah. And there was another thing too. Eric right now was, was realizing the numbers that you were talking about. So he realized things were on the upswing. He had no time with a, uh, a wrestler manager, if you will, or a piece of talent, let's say trying to hold him up and trying to say, I'm going to go somewhere else because Eric thought, you know what? Fucking go because we're getting big and we'll be big without you, which if you think about it, Conrad, it's probably the right thing to do. I've, I've always thought that wrestling was bigger than, than one person with the exception of maybe Hogan or flair, but I always thought wrestling was bigger than one person and the company would survive. If you would leave, uh, Johnny B bad was certainly a, a, a talent. Uh, but, uh, we got the booty man. What the fuck? Right. We got the booty man. What the fuck? Right. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm going to give you the same reaction that I had when I first heard that this was happening. No, yeah. I'm not selling it. I want to yeah. I want to read you exactly what Meltzer wrote here, which is kind of fun. All right. Um, we're going to skip to the end here. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, booty man then kissed Kimberly and she sold it. Like it was the first kiss of her life. Even by the standards of pro wrestling, this angle is the most unrealistic thing in the world. Dud. Yeah. I mean, Tony, you're saying on, on commentary here that the fucking booty man looks like a million bucks, but it's a horrible gimmick. Yeah. And you're trying your best to put it over. You're saying something like, you know, he's one of the best in the world. And this is at the same time that you've got Benoit and Guerrero Mm -hmm. and Malenko and Ric Flair. Yeah. Well, what do you want me to say there? Dirt sheet boy. I'm with you. I'm just saying you're doing your best. You guys are all doing your best and you're, you're, you're trotting out beautiful women in this, but it's just, fuck, this is so WCW 96 here. Is it not? Yeah, it is. It it really, really is. Uh, But, uh, I mean, we could have uh, Jim Duggan and Big Bubba. That's what I'm saying. That in there. It feels like <laughs> it feels like this is, um, you know, we we sort of talked earlier about how this doesn't feel like it's just two months before Scott Hall comes in and the business sort of goes more realistic. This still feels 1995 WCW, yeah, rather than '96. I mean, right? Because yeah. everything's going to change. And golly, man, how roll tight is Kim? Oof. Yeah, she's, she is smoking here. Uh, she always was smoking. She was, a, as we've said many times, she was a freaking 10, man. I'm just saying Here. you guys are doing, uh, you know, you've commented on how they often don't shoot Deborah or Medusa or any of the yeah. women at ringside the right way. Yeah. She's all over this. I yeah. mean, wh- whoever is in the truck here got yeah. the memo. Kimberly's roll tight. Yeah, she's a, she's go dogs. I don't think there's any question. Uh, and, you know, uh, also here. Let me say something, and, and it, uh, it just struck a chord with me, with myself. Uh, if we would have stuck Duggan and Bubba in the show or stuck another match in the show, then they wouldn't have to be uh, using these uh, rest holds right here that no one's fucking buying. Well, and it would have been it would have been less of a dud because some reason, and this was old school Kevin Sullivan thinking, some reason everybody thought that you had to go 15 to 20 minutes on a pay-per-view match. You didn't. No, you, you didn't. You could have pasted better. Well, you know, what about throwing in JL and Dean Malenko? Right, right. Absolutely. The nasties and the Steiners. And I know that yes. the nasty boys are, I, th- I still think the nasty boys are criminally underrated. You yep. look at a lot of their pay-per-view matches and man, they're beating the shit out of each other. And obviously the Steiners were too. If you would have given them 10 minutes, you maybe could have trimmed a little here, trimmed a little there. No question. And that Steiners nasty boys match could have really contributed to this card. Right. And would have cut some of these matches down and. And made him a little bit less of a dud than they were. And now uh, Paige wants to talk to Kimberly. 16 so let, minutes here is where mm, we're going. So let's follow Kimberly up the steps. Yikes. Oh, stay, well, they got off that shot quickly. And now he gives her the big old smooch to try to win her back. And what does she do? Kaboom. And that's going to lead to the high knee. All right, one, two, three, booty man. I don't think everybody gets the the joke here with the finish. What's the booty man's finish? The high knee. <laughs> the high knee. Aha! Now you, oh, now you got it. Man, if I'm working something there, I'm going to lay one on her too. She let's so let's just talk through this. You know, being Hogan's weed carrier might not be that bad. <laughs> you know, you get to make a bunch of money, get, get to do that. Now here's what's fun. As you may recall, DDP's career is on the line here. That's sort of yeah. the gimmick. Right. So if he loses, he's out of WCW. Yeah. And, um, Doug Dillinger well, saying, get out of here. He lost. Yeah. It's over. You guys do a commercial here on the pay-per-view somewhere. Um, and it's for the hotline and you actually blurred out Johnny B bad's face. Do you remember that? Uh, yes. How great is that? That's yeah. so, that's so petty bullshit. I love it. Yeah. You're not kidding. Kaboom. Petty. Bu- I, you know, there's something to be said about petty bullshit and we, there's the hiney. There's the hiney. One, two, three. Yes, sir. Your winner is the booty man. Brutus, the barber beefcake. Uh, the, uh, the yes, no yin yang, whatever we called him 
and he gets the kiss. And there you go. But now let's go back to Mean Gene. Thank you very much, Tony Schiavone. I'm here with Total Package. Lex Luger is all oiled up. And I'm also here with a very distraught, uh, and I don't know why it is, Lex, but uh, Jimmy Hart here, he has something in his hand. We want to talk to Lex Luger. There's a foul smell going on around here, Jimmy, and tell me exactly what in the world you're up to and what in the world is going on. Well, uh, let me tell you, Mean Gene, as we've been talking about uh, the Loch Ness Monster. Uh, I tried to wipe his ass, and unfortunately I tried to wipe his ass with this coat, this Lex Luger coat, and it smells so bad that I just cannot stay around here. Lex, I'm going to give this coat back to you. Uh, we tried to wipe the ass of the big guy. I just can't say it anymore, and i got to leave. You can have the coat. Get the fuck out of here, you fucking weed. All right, let's talk to Lex Luger. Lex, uh, uh, despite that foul, don't wear the thing, man. Despite this, uh, all right, Gene, here's, here's the deal. Uh, I'm all oiled up. I'm going to be in the main event. I'm looking as only I can look. Thank you for talking to Jimmy Hart first because that enabled me, enabled me to look at myself for about 35 seconds. But now let's talk about what's going on. Hulk Hogan, I'm part of this, and I'm a big star. And as you know, I have people at the bar peel my shrimp, but I also have people here in WCW oil my back and oil my front. Now, whoa, 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 Lex, oil your back. Give me a fucking break. Well, that's right. Oil my back because my back has to be as shiny, as glistening, as clean as my washboard abs, as my pecs, as my biceps, as I tell you right now, get ready for it because I'm going to draw the line with my finger. There's my finger. It's a part of me. In just a moment, I'm going to draw that line right straight across. Oh, God, this jacket stinks. There it is. I just drew the all right, well, Lex Luger, thanks for drawing the line. Take that jacket, if you will, and do something with it because that is a foul smell. Speaking of a foul smell, let's go back to ringside. Unbelievable, uh, that promo. If you go back and, and watch this without us doing commentary, you'll see Jimmy Hart said something to me and Gene like, this is the last time I'm going to walk to the ring with Lex, and I just want to tell you that I love you. And Gene yeah. immediately deadpans and says, blow it out your ass, <laughs> which to me, I, I mean, it feels like he was in on our gimmick before we were, and here comes Loch Ness. And this is something that I didn't even really remember about mm -hmm. WCW, but Loch Ness is a guy who, uh, I think, I mean, I know I didn't know he was as fucking old as he is. Yeah, you know, been I around just, a long time. Yeah, no shit. Of course, he is the original giant haystacks, and um, he died at uh, age fifty-one. But that was in nineteen ninety-eight. So the homie was born in forty-seven. Mm. Uh, it, it's pretty amazing to me that he was here in WCW at the end, and I don't even know that I really put two and two together. Yeah, no, you know what? Uh, most of us didn't, uh, but he. He wasn't 700 pounds right here, but we made him out to be 700 pounds. And here comes Jimmy Hart out because he thought now that he was going to be killed by this giant haystacks Loch Ness monster. And, you know, we're, we're in the early stages of Paul White's career. Uh, and I always, I always thought that Paul White was going to be a big, 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 big star. Well, let's not forget that just six months prior to this, he was murdered. He was thrown off the top of right. uh, Kobo in Detroit, right. but miraculously he came back to life. And, uh, with the help of the Yeti, they not only butt fucked Hulk Hogan, right. They took the world title off him. Well, sure. And you know, let's face that Hulk Hogan was going to kill everything, including the giant. Is it fair to say that knowing how the finish of that all came down, that the giant is actually the, well, you know, at least in 95 was the butt fucking champion of the world. <laughs> I don't know if you call him that, but you could call the Yeti that. All right. Well, but he never won any. He never won the title, you know. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, I mean, I, I got it. This, this to me, you know, the giant here is athletic as as nobody's business. Obviously, Loch Ness, not so much. This is a bit of a waste of the giant, is it not? Uh, of course, it is. Did you say that uh, the Loch Ness would die in 98? So yep. he's dead two years later. 
Yeah. And here, here he is in the ring. It, it's and, amazing to me though, that again, Steiner brothers, nasty boys, Jerry Lynn, Dean Malenko, Dick Slater, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, wall street. He's a draw big Bubba yeah. Rogers. You got all these guys not on the show, right? Loch Ness, let's fucking get his ass out. Where's Booty Man? Man? Get his yeah. ass out there. <laughs> All right, uh, let me ask you this: What was the uh, what was the critique of this match by all seeing, all knowing DM? Oh, I like that you're calling it that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Loch Ness comes out. Oh, by the way, this is worth mentioning. I, I do want to mention this because right. when I when I watched this for the first time, I guess in maybe 15 years, I forgot, and so. When Loch Ness starts coming out, I'm like, is this fucking Ray Mysterio? He comes out to Ray Mysterio's music, <laughs> which is pretty fun. <laughs> um, the giant pin Loch Ness in two minutes and 34 seconds with a leg drop giant took one great bump, which supposedly wasn't planned. Loch Ness is the worst, but I think this is the last we'll see of him. Negative mm-hmm. one star. Okay. And of course he was, this was one of the last times we would see him. He yeah, winds up being diagnosed with cancer and leaves WCW to return to, uh, great Britain. And he passed away in March or I'm sorry, November of 98 of lymphoma, which, uh, I think a lot of people, when you see a guy this big, you start to think, well, he's going to have some sort of heart issues. But it was actually lymphoma that got him two years later. Mm. Wow. This is just a, a fucking train wreck. And it's not like we haven't seen him before, right? I mean, we've seen shitty matches before. Well, how about the big Hogan leg drop? The from, uh, and, and, you know, here's the deal. I, I, when I watched that, I thought, man, as athletic as the giant is, that leg drop was the shits. You know, obviously yeah. Hulk Hogan, who has used a leg drop as a finish, people have been critical of that finish forever. But Hulk Hogan's leg drop smoked that one. But in fairness, Giant's still very new in his career. Probably didn't want to hurt the guy. I mean, the guy's old enough to be his dad here, so he's going to yeah. take it easy on him. Well, there was a thought backstage area here, Conrad, that they wanted him to choke slam this guy. And Paul said, I, I can't get him up. Even if he helps me, I, I can't get him up. And that, that was the thing. They wanted to put over the choke slam, so they kind of restructured a little bit for the Hogan leg drop. Because well, he's, not, he's not 700 pounds. But, but he's, he's 500. Every, and, and, yeah, and it, yeah. You, you can't just pick 500 pounds up with one hand over your head. like Right. Let's not get crazy with this giant gimmick. I mean, there it is. He's not giant wins it. He's not climbing beanstalks, you know? (laughs) Exactly. Oh, all right. Well, we're rolling on towards a couple of, uh, matches, uh, one match, but right now let's go back to Lee Marshall. Hey, this show is great. And I'm going to shake my head and nod and look around and not look at the camera enough, but that doesn't matter. Because I want to bring in with me right now two of the great stars in WCW, Booker T and the man called Sting. Dun, dun, dun. I also sing a little bit too, as you probably didn't know. Uh, come on in here, Sting, to my left. And I want to talk a little bit to you. I want to talk a little bit to Booker T because this gentleman is a very, very odd matchup to have you two be on the same team. Let me say something here a minute. There, I'm going to talk a little bit about Sting. I want to get him all loose up. I want to get him all thrilled about what's going to happen here because suckers got to know, as Stevie Ray would say, and that's also a T-shirt at LowestRules.com. By the way, we're still selling that, even though we can't sell Sonorize. I want to get Sting fired up. Sting, here's how I'm going to fire you up. I'm going to tell you a joke, okay? Going to make you laugh, all right? Stay with me now. What is the favorite cereal of English teachers? Do you know what that is, sucker? No, I don't know what it is, but I need you to tell me the favorite cereal of English teachers. Man, you are so funny. So tell me what it is. What is the favorite? What's the favorite? What is it? Tell me what it is. What's it? It is the grapes of nuts of wrath. Ha! Well, that's funny. That's funny. I got another one for you. I got one for you. How many princesses does it take to screw in a light bulb? Do you know the answer? I'm looking out to the fans here because I'm Sting and a man called Sting. Do you know the answer to that, Booker T? Let me tell you. The answer is none. Princesses do not. Screw in light bulbs, motherfucker. Wait a minute now. Let's stop telling jokes. Let's talk about the match you got coming up against the Road Warriors. That motherfucker is funny, and I'm funny. And let me say this. I got four fingers up, but we're not members of the Four Horsemen because suckers got 
to know. Suckers gots to know. Buy the shirt at LoisRules.com or Sting's going to come at you. What Sting is it going to be? Is it going to be the crow or is it going to be the surfer Sting? Tell me, motherfucker, what to, I, was, should I say something? Yeah, all right, I'm going to talk here a little bit. It's going to be a great match, and I'm going to oversell it. Whoa. So get your T-shirts at LoisRules.com because suckers gots to know. You know, I'm glad that you said that because we haven't talked about shirts enough and I want to, but I do want to sort of touch on this sting tries to talk gangsta here at the beginning. And he says yeah. something like straight OG brother, right? <laughs> right. And then Booker says something like, don't make me knock you out right now, sucker, which <laughs> I think is funny because every now and again, you break out your Tony Schiavone patented black guy voice. Yeah. And, uh, I just can't help but think that if maybe Booker T was around to help us do a show one day. He would look mm -hmm. at you and hit you with the, tell me you didn't just say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, over the last week, uh, Mike Jones has become my favorite rapper. Who? Mike Jones. You know, if you haven't listened to our last episode, I think it's probably in our top five. I really <laughs> do think that last week's episode is one of our top five all time, but the number one t-shirt with a bullet. I was even, you know, able to do a live show with Bruce Pritchard this weekend, uh, up to, uh, or down in Fort Lauderdale, uh, just outside of there, I guess in sunrise, Florida, the, the hockey fans came out in mass to support uh, our live podcast. And Pat Patterson was our guest and we had a wow. great time, but in the crowd, I saw a ton of wrestling shirts and I saw, I feel like almost as many for your show as I did Bruce, but the number one, one I saw, of course, Tommy young, how about that? Tommy young, uh, unfortunately, Tommy young had been injured prior to this. So we did not get, did not get Tommy young and his, uh, his antics, if you will, or his, uh, what he brought to the, to the matches because he was hurt early in the WCW run. That was unfortunate, but, uh, Hey, thanks for you and that the motherfucking Bruce motherfucking Pritchard brother love for inviting me to your shows. I was down and did you guys go to the sunrise, the musical theater? Is that where you did your show? No, we did it. Um, at the hockey arena, BB and T. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. We're, Very cool. we're a big, big deal. You know, yeah, the, the NHL deal. calls and they're like, yeah. Hey man, can you do yeah. us a favor? Yeah. We need that Bruce Pritchard dust. So, well, yeah. you know, ta-da, there we go. But I'm sure if you and I ever have a chance to do a show together yeah. uh, in Florida, maybe a reunion show or whatever, we could mm -hmm. probably get like a couple dozen fans to Jimmy Hart's restaurant, right? Yeah, I think so. And you know what we should do probably is if we ever get a couple of dozen fans to like Jimmy's restaurant bar, Tiki bar down at Daytona beach, we ought to spend the whole time shitting on Bruce Pritchard like you and Bruce Pritchard shit on me when you do your show. That's what I think we should do, but that's just, let's go back to the match here. And uh, this is a Chicago street fight. And now on the outside, uh, we see one of the road warriors and man, you know, uh, yeah, sting was a big star here, but was there, there was no question about it that Booker T was on the threshold of being a big star. Uh, yeah, I can't wait to talk about that, but I want to sell you some shit first. Loisrules.com. Go pick right. up a t-shirt right now. Yeah. Uh, we've had lots of questions about, Hey, when the podcast ends, will you still guys, will you guys still have a t-shirt store? Absolutely. Will Tony still call you? Yeah. Eventually. Uh, will the archives come down? No, they're going to be on YouTube. So go pick up loisrules.com. Tony, can we throw something out there that we say, if we get a certain number of t-shirt sales for you or something, we'll do bonus episodes or, you know, we get lots of requests. Hey, if Tony doesn't want to do it every week, could you guys do it like once a month or, I mean, are, are you still, is there any consideration? Are we going to be able to twist your arm and talk you into doing anything different? Or have you got your mind made up or what? Well, look, look. Look, this is a podcast and it's a podcast about wrestling. And I've made the, the fact known that there's a lot of bullshit on here. A lot of bullshit that comes out of my mouth and really comes out of Con Conrad is full of bullshit. Uh, so just let me say that. But let me also say that back in January of 2017, Conrad talked me into the shit. So who knows? I could be talked into anything. Well, I, mean, I was talked into marrying Lois fucking burger. My God, was I talked into that? Well, hopefully we've talked you into buying a shirt uh, yeah. because we want you to be able to 
support what happened when Tony Schiavone decided to come out of retirement and do a podcast. Yeah. So go to lowestrules.com. Uh, pick up Tommy Young, Loki, Big Hog, hashtag NFLTG. Suckers got to know. Woo. Easy way, hard way. Damn, I'm yep. good. All kinds of fun shirts here at lowestrules.com. And eventually, Tony will give you a call. It's the best way to support the show uh, as we sort of wind it down. We got a right. Chicago street fight here, man. And three of the four competitors are in paint. And Booker T is in singles action here. Uh, well, not really singles action. He's in a tag action, but without Stevie Ray. Right. Did you know already at this point that Booker T was going to be sort of the Shawn Michaels of the group? Well, yeah. I, if you want to call him the Shawn Michaels of the group, I, of, of, of like the the Rockers, okay. The uh, yeah, sure. I don't think there was any question. Booker T could do a lot of things, and Stevie Ray, for all of his, you know, and and I love Stevie. He and I became good buddies, but he was not the worker that uh, that Booker was. And uh, yeah, we knew that. Absolutely. We did. Uh, can I say something here? Can I inject something that is completely off the cuff here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, MLW major league wrestling. I've enjoyed working that. And there's some big news coming up in the month of April about major league wrestling. Big news. So that's, you just have to keep watching. There's rumor and innuendo that you're calling matches for MLW and people can enjoy it over at, uh, like MLW.tv right now. Right. Right. And there's also some matches that they've put some events they have put on YouTube, YouTube, MLW, YouTube channel, but, uh, something's going to get bigger. Wow. Big news coming. Yeah. So yeah. here you go. Who knew a, a pro wrestling podcast could get, uh, you get Tony Schiavone back into wrestling and it sort of eases him in. I guess I'm like your gateway drug, right? Like, yeah, you know, I, yeah. I get you doing the podcast and that's like your, your marijuana pills <laughs> and then enough time passes and court talks you into calling a couple of matches that are going to maybe, maybe be video on demand or I pay per view. Yeah. And that's like the first time you did acid. And <laughs> now if the rumor and innuendo is true. We're about to I'm have cooking. you on the vein, baby. Yeah, man. I'll be cooking math here pretty soon. <laughs> Well, you know, if we didn't sell enough t-shirts, you were willing to pull out all the stops, pay for this fucking wedding, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And it's, it's, I, I, I can't tell you enough. One more thing about t-shirts. I enjoy talking to people. A lot of people, when they, when they find out it's me, will say, well, I don't want to keep you on the phone. Thank you very much for calling. They want to get it over quickly, I guess. They don't know what to say. If you want to keep me on there, please talk to me. Uh, and, uh, but if you have nothing to say, obviously we're going to move on, but i have really enjoyed connecting with the fans. I'm, gosh, it, it's been great, man. You know what we just realized? What I just realized as we were talking through this, when you said, "Hey, cooking meth before you know it," uh-huh. I thought, you know, this is almost like a Breaking Bad storyline because in in that show, of course, Walter mm. White thinks he's dying of cancer and he's got to raise a bunch of money to take care of his family, yeah. and you have to raise a bunch of money to take care of your family with this wedding. Right. So instead of cooking meth, you did t-shirts. Maybe we right. should, maybe we should come up with one last shirt that says something like breaking bad commentary. Yeah. Or that, or maybe we should just take all the shirts, stuff them in a shitty looking RV and you and I go across the country. I mean, now, what are we doing in the RV though? Well, we're selling shirts. We're not cooking meth. Okay. So, I was going to say, I, yeah, I, I don't really know shirts. how to do that. Okay. I'm I'm not good at that. Not good at what selling shirts or, or, or driving an RV. Well, you get the statements every month. How am I doing at selling shirts? Yeah. Tremendous. Okay. So I'm pretty good at that, <laughs> but this whole cooking meth thing. I don't, I don't know. No, no, I'm, I, I wouldn't know. You know, I, Hey, we could get Tommy rich and get him on the road with us. <laughs> stop. You stop. Like motherfucker. What? Hey, uh, I wouldn't. He's I the NWA could, world heavyweight champion. Okay. Listen. Stop with the rumor and innuendo bullshit. Well, okay. No, he was the okay. NWA champion. That's not a rumor. I know. But, but why'd you bring his name up? Well, because I think he's available. Oh, okay. I, I, mean, I think it'd be hilarious. God damn, baby. Uh, <laughs> something something fucked up on the RV might be a carburetor. You know, <laughs> carburetors on them 78 Winnebago's don't want to get fucked up on you. Somebody say something about selling a t shirt. <laughs> 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 oh my god that was worth it the whole show that was worth it uh, let's just fucking turn the mics off we don't even need the cage 
Uh, we're having too much fun here, gang. And uh, the wedding is coming up this week. Thank you for all your support. Hey, I want to smarten everybody up about what I got planned next week. So I'm going to make my trek from Huntsville, Alabama to the suburbs of Atlanta. And I'm going to uh, fire up the microphone every little bit and sort of catch you up. I may or may not make a stop along the way. Mm. And once we actually get there, might have a little interaction before the wedding. Mm -hmm. uh, And then I might be able to sneak a word or two from the wedding on there. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be able to get all of your speech. So if you can't listen live on Facebook live, which is going to happen. So uh, it might be the last time you get to see Tony Schiavone live until April. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Then I'm going to go ahead and try to set up camp somewhere at the reception and one by one sort of get some feedback and get a few minutes on the show with some of the Shivani clan. Have you smartened everybody up to that yet on your side? I have, I have not. And I've, I've got a, a number of friends. I don't have many friends. I've got a number of high profile friends from Atlanta. who are going to be at your table. And so you can talk to them too. It should be a lot of fun. Oh, I, I don't care about those slap dicks. I want Matt <laughs> Shivani. I want Chris Shivani. I want Lois Shivani. I want to get, if your last name ain't Shivani, I don't really want to fucking talk to you. <laughs> okay. Because I need to know about when dad would come down in his tidy whities with the yellow stains in the front and the brown stains in the back mm-hmm. and, uh, do commentary on their matches when they mm-hmm. had action figures out there. Mm. Well, I, I didn't do much of that, but can I tell you something now that you may not know about me? I'm ready. And you may not want to know about me and Lois will confirm this. Oh, when wait, wait, next can week? I just freestyle? I, I bet I know what you're about to say. Well, you go ahead. You go commando. Yes, I walk around. No, I walk around the house naked a lot. What? Yep, I do. Why? What type of fucking because, a- animal because, are you? Because I fucking can. It's just me and her. Okay, she doesn't give a shit. She doesn't look up. The oh, you're not was, saying the, like when when your daughter lived at home, you weren't. No, like, it's just now with me and Lois, I walk around naked now all I, the time. Hypothetically, yeah. if I were to come over to your house unannounced, and let's say you left the garage door open, and I just. Yeah sneak in through the kitchen and laundry room or whatever. And yeah, when I get in there, I see you're like sacked out on the couch. Right. Would I be able to tell whether or not you had an Afghan on you? <laughs> uh, yeah, you'd be able to tell. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So, but yeah, it's a, I mean, listen, all everybody listen to us. When, when, if you've got family, you got kids at home and those kids are gone and you're an empty nester and just you and the wife and the dog, especially you got a wife like mine, Lois doesn't even look up at me at all. Uh, just either sewing or on her phone <clears throat> or drinking. Uh, just it's your home. You paid for it. Walk around naked. What the fuck? Let me ask you this. Is Lois strutting that ass around the house naked too? Oh, no, 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 no. I wouldn't go for that, buddy. Hey, are you, um, so are you like the dancing bear at your house? <laughs> uh, oh, look at that move. I was to go back to the ring. Don't Google that by the way. <laughs> okay. Oh, all right. Go back to the ring. Go. And they're out in the street fight. It's Boy. a Croatian record label, but other people listening may have a different connotation for it. Okay. All right. So there you go. Are we, we're in the middle of a Chicago street fight here, aren't we? Is, we is are. This thing, is this thing going like 10 minutes too long or am I? It's about 78 minutes. Yeah. This match is it's, uh, it, I mean, they do have a lot of talent here in the ring. I mean, yep. you know, big no stars, but the match is, uh, 25 minutes or so. Oh. Yeah. And keep in mind, there are only like two more matches to go in this show. Right. So no, let me correct that. It's 29 minutes and 33 seconds. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, again, there was a time and, and I'm not, I'm not so sure when the time is, if you follow WCW through the years, you will know when it is. If you're can remember things better than I do, but there was a time when someone said, and it may have been when Vince Russo arrived, someone said, We've got to cut down the time on these fucking matches on the pay-per-view. So we did. And then we got to the point to where they were too short. I feel like I should mention here that, um, the gimmick here is if sting and Booker win the Harlem heat, get a shot at the tag titles. Yeah. How about that? You think this match is maybe like Booker T's coming out party as like a big star. Cause this is really a high profile match. I mean, you go. And for the last 10 years in the business, um, these three guys have been main event stars. You know, you got a world champion, arguably the greatest tag team of all time. 
and Booker T. Now, of course, we know what Booker T would become, but he had not yet become that here in March of 96. Right. This could be seen as that. I, you know, I really think he started really coming out, so to speak, when, you know, when Russo got here and, and pushed him as a big star. Uh, but, uh, again, a Chicago street fight, I guess means, uh, no rules. Anything goes, uh, Hawk even said during the promo that, uh, that he did that the only way to, and, and this is, this was Hawk, man. I, I loved him. He said, the only way to beat us would be to do something illegal to beat us. And that's what they did. In other words, he knew what the finish was during the interview and he was going to do a little foreshadowing on it. To, to uh, kind of set you up for the fact that, yeah, he was right. That mother, He was right. The only way to, for us to legally, for them to win is to hit us with something. Look at these guys. They're just all over each other. You know, not the smoothest match. And nobody ever called the Road Warriors that anyway. But it does right. feel like at this point that the Road Warriors are, you know, well past their prime. Would well, you... yeah, yeah, it feels that way. And this match is making it seem that way for them. Road Warriors don't need to be in a 30 minute match. That's exactly right. They need to be here squashing dudes. Right. Let's do 10 minutes and show off what we can do. But you've got exactly. them with two younger guys, two, you know, more agile guys. Maybe not the best call. No, not at all. And of course, yeah, again, we do a lot of armchair quarterbacking here. Uh, another old cliche is hindsight is 2020. And we have a, a, we have, we can do that now. But yeah, the, and look, the fans have had enough of it. Uh, because, well, they've had enough of it. Well, you and I've had enough of it. This Chicago street fight thing too, like a year later, if they were doing a Chicago street fight and by the way, they did, this is worth mentioning. This is March of 1996. And if you fast forward to March of 1997, they, the road warriors here, the Legion of doom were in the WWF and they did do a Chicago street fight in Chicago for WrestleMania. And there were weapons galore. And my point was a year later, the ring would be littered with trash, you know, garbage cans, two by fours, fire extinguishers, chairs, tables, whatever. Yeah. But here it's a Chicago street fight. And that just means occasionally we wander down the aisle. Right. So what are you saying that they knew what they were doing a lot more in the WWF than we did? I'm saying, if you know, you can't do blood and you know, you don't want to use weapons as violence. Maybe don't promote this as a Chicago street fight and do a traditional match. So somebody can work as a heel and somebody can make a hot tag and they can get heat on a guy. I mean, that seems to be like something that the crowd will respond to, but as it is now, you've just got seemingly two singles matches going on, but it's essentially no count out because there's not really crazy weapons being used. Right. I, I agree with you hundred percent there. old great grandson of Loch Ness monster. I think it is. You're exactly right. And right now they're, they're just flip flopping and flying and kicking everything and punching everything that moves and nothing makes any sense here at all. Doesn't it feel like, you know, sting should have been thrown on the Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage team. And we should have had, you know, the nasties or the Steiners or something else here in this tag match. Maybe that was the answer. Maybe you should have done a three way yeah. with the nasties, the Steiners and the road warriors, and then throw sting in the main event. I mean, obviously that's not what they're going for. They're going for Hulk Hogan versus the world. Right. But this just feels sort of thrown together, even with the stipulation of there's a Chicago street fight and there's not a weapon inside. It just means, Hey, you don't have to make tags. Well, they should have, th- look, they could have thrown, uh, the road warriors, in, uh, and it would have been 10 on one because the road warriors were, were, they were, we were kind of making the road warriors heelish here. Even our commentary tried to turn them that way a little bit. So why not? I feel like I should, um, tell everybody that I don't know that everybody even knows this, but half of the ring right now has a podcast. Uh, Booker T has a podcast called heated conversations with Booker T. Uh, his, his man, Brad is the co-host there and it's worth a listen. And Road Warrior Animal actually has a podcast called What a Rush Podcast with Joe Roderick out of St. Louis. So obviously, uh, you know, there's going to be an opportunity for you to maybe check out some other podcasts soon. Might as well go ahead and tell you Booker T has one and Animal has one for your enjoyment. So look up Heated Conversations out of Houston with Booker T and Brad and um, What a Rush Pod with Joe, Road Warrior Animal. And Joe Roderick from St. Louis. 
Well, let me say this also, that I, I think that, uh, again, I'm going to put over Bruce Pritchard and, and you here, even though you guys buried the shit out of me on your podcast. Uh, the, the fact is that I'm going to say that you guys, uh, something to wrestle with, Bruce Pritchard, uh, set the standard for podcasts that were different. And you and I have tried to do that here in that most wrestling podcasts look around and try to get an interview with somebody. We don't. We talk to each other and we go back and we, we try to relive the memories of WCW. We try to get you to go back and remember your childhood. If you grew up, if you were a millennial like Conrad uh, and, and grew up in the nineties. Uh, and so uh, that's what we try to do here. And I think we've done a hell of a job doing that. Well, and you know, one of the things I wanted to do was to do more live shows. Of course, we had the opportunity to do a super show last June with uh, you and Bruce in Dallas, mm -hmm. which was fun. Mm -hmm. And I tried to talk you into doing one this year at WrestleMania. That didn't yeah. work out. You've got 19 jobs. I'm going to try to talk you into doing one in September. If this whole podcast convention thing happens in conjunction with, uh, Starcast. of course, we're waiting for more details on that all in super show from Cody and the young bucks, but wow. Okay. Allegedly it's a podcast convention. And I know, I think that's labor day weekend. And that's when you're probably going to have an opportunity to call the Georgia Bulldogs hosting some community college that y'all are bringing yeah. to town to beat up. Yeah. Um, but if that, whole, if that Hawaiian wouldn't pull, pull the football out of his ass, you'd be calling them the national champion, Georgia Bulldogs right now. No, no, but I'm saying you're not playing, you know, like last year, Alabama opened their season against Florida state. They were ranked right. like number three right. before we just devastated them and they were never the same, but I think you guys are playing like Eastern Mississippi community college or some Aust shit that way. Aust Austin P. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From Nashville. There you go. Yeah. Well, that's on, uh, that's that weekend. That's a Saturday. Who knows, man? Who knows? Who freaking knows? Did you guys just recently go to Nashville, Tennessee, you and Bruce? No, not yet. We're going on September 30th. Tickets are available now at mustpose.com, but they're selling fast. Right. Uh, we put it on it on sale way in advance. And to my surprise, it's almost completely sold out. Well, Ori originally WWE was going to come to town or so we thought. Uh, right. but now WWE is not even doing a pay-per-view in Nashville. Bruce and I are just going and trying to hang out and make a few bucks. I made a phone call just yesterday, uh, to a fan from Tennessee who said he was going to that show and he had tickets. He said, I would love since it's only three hours from your house. I would love for you to make an appearance there. I said, well, those motherfuckers haven't invited me. So now, now uh, hang on now. Let's be clear. First of all, September 30th. Mm. So what are you doing? September 30th. Okay, uh, you guys, are, wait a minute, hang on. That guy told me that it was on a Sunday. It is. It's okay. on Sunday, September 30th. All right, so Saturday, September 29th, I am in Athens for Athens and the Tennessee Volunteers, uh, the Georgia Bulldogs Tennessee Volunteers. My point being, it's so um, fucking far in advance, I okay. haven't bothered anybody with what they're doing on September 30th yet. Uh, oh, got you. I thought you were trying to. No, no, I'm, I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying, golly, okay. it's six and a half months away. I didn't think we were pressed for time. Well, you know what? By the time September 30th comes around, this motherfucking Chicago street fight might still be going on. I know. Oh my the, God. The, what have is, we done? To me, this is the worst match on the card. Yeah. Um, I mean, behind the giant and Loch Ness and DDP right. and booty man. So, okay. Never mind. It's right in the middle. My bad. Okay. All right. Chat me up though. Um, will I be able to talk you out of. Your semi podcast retirement and to do a live show every now and again. Yeah, if if it falls on the right day, sure. So basically but, you're saying if it's a Tuesday or a Wednesday. No. Well, if, it's get, a, if it's if it's a Sunday and we're not on the baseball road trip. You know, I I just I've made I uh, I've just made some commitments and I don't want to get out of them. Um Yeah, because here's the deal. You know, Bruce and I sold out, not one, but two shows, WrestleMania weekend. Mm -hmm. And the number one request I get was, Hey, wh when's the Tony Schiavone show? Yeah. And I'm like, he, he, he didn't want to do one or can't do one. Well, all right. Look the, for you, uh, fans who were with us in Dallas, when we did that show, um, I, I, we got a great response and the fans were great. And I went around, if you'll recall, and I, and I shook hands with all of them, uh, because it was, you know, it was a small bar setting in it, but I, I didn't think I was that good. I thought you and Bruce were good. I didn't think I was that good in the live setting, but you never think you're any good. And, and that doesn't matter. The fans are listening and that's what they want. All right. Well, we'll see. 
hey, it's just the beginning of of 2018. We'll see. You never know what 2018 brings. And if you're a wrestling fan, just hang in there, motherfuckers. I feel like I should mention here, um, three and a half stars is what this match gets. Really? And it's just so fucking long. It's just really hard for me to. Yeah, it, it's it's so long. And and not only that, uh, the, the split screen, I get it why they're doing it. But to me, it's it just... It just takes away something. You just don't know what to watch. And they, they stay static on this split screen for a long time. And to me, it's, I don't know. It's, it's a way of, well, we'll just not, we'll just not have to switch it and not worry about missing something. We'll just do the split screen, but it doesn't work for me. It never did. At times it works, but to stay on this split screen shot for a long time does not work for me. Right. So I, it's just, uh, anyway. All right. So what else we go talk about while this match drolls on? Well, let's talk about the rumor and innuendo that you guys oh, actually tried to get Dennis Rodman to be your special guest referee for the main event. Do you remember hearing about that? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, Rodman would come, you know, a little bit later, I guess, uh, during the NWO era, but, uh, yeah, they, they worked on trying to get Rodman. A lot because Rodman was a Hogan guy. And, uh, you know, we got on the first match, if you'll recall, we had uh, Shaquille O'Neal come out when Hogan came out. And so getting Rodman was just another one of those ploys to try to get him to be a part of it. But they couldn't come to terms. Let's talk about the clusterfuck of a main event for a minute. Um, Mm -hmm. You're giving a rundown of the rules before the match. And you said something like, rules, I understand, are very simple. Hulk Mm -hmm. Hogan and Macho Man Randy Savage will start at the top like a gauntlet. Once they Mm -hmm. get through a cage, if they win that particular cage then those men would be eliminated till they work their way down to the bottom, they can pin Hulk Hogan or beat macho man, Randy Savage at any time, but Hogan and Savage must go through every man to win their match. Mm -hmm. And Bobby replied with Tony, you're talking about rules. They don't care about rules. There is not going to be any rules. They're going to get in that cage and go after the big white tiger, Hulk Hogan and tear the red and yellow off his carcass, you know it. Uh, and then of course, as they're all getting into their respective cages, Bobby's trying to put it over and say, what a great thing for television. I've never seen anything like this in my life, Mm -hmm. but the reality is you guys had done this triple cage gimmick Mm -hmm. way back in 1988. Yes. uh, Didn't we cover it here on the show? We did. That was uh, at the time. Was that a dusty creation? Was that a Kevin Sullivan creation? And whose idea was it? That that was a dusty creation back then. And then of course, Kevin Sullivan was involved in that too. You know, Kevin was kind of like, um, a good sounding board for dusty roads and dusty for him. They were, they were friends and they, uh, they both had the old school mentality as we're seeing right here as this Chicago street fight moves on. Um, so yeah, that was a dusty creation. Um, you guys are pulling out all the stops here for this cage match. Z gangsta, of course, uh, mm-hmm. is the guy we know as Zeus from Hulk Hogan's no holds barred movie. He works SummerSlam 89 and some other stuff. Um, but you had an opportunity to get to know him in the WWF when you were there, right? Yeah. So I when, liked him. I liked him a lot. When you hear that. Uh, Zeus, Tony, tiny Lister is, uh, yeah. coming back to wrestling and doing something. Is this something you're excited about? Or are you sort of laughing out loud at what the fuck are we doing? Well, it's, it's kind of both. I'm, I'm kind of saying what the fuck are we doing? But I'm also glad to see tiny again. Cause tiny was a cool motherfucker, buddy. He was a good guy. And, uh, I'd enjoy talking to him friendly as he could be. And you know, he had a big part in the Batman, uh, movie, the second Batman movie. You know that, don't you? Are you? I think you're thinking about a different guy. No, same guy. Same guy. What was the, what was it? What did he do? It, it was, uh, they had, uh, the Joker had the two, uh, boats, uh, and each boat had a, uh, device to blow up the other boat. And one boat had all the, uh, the guys from prison and the other, the other boat had just a bunch of people and tiny Lister took the thing and threw it out the window. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You, yeah. you meant yeah. modern era Batman. I thought you yeah, were talking right. about Bat, like the '89 version. I'm yeah. like, no, right. no he I'm, wasn't in that. I'm, yeah. Well, okay. here's now, the the real reason he was. Oh, notice what just happened here on the screen. Lex was sort of primping himself up 
Yep. And Road Warrior gives him a double axe handle by mistake when Booker T moves out of the way. And now all of a sudden Lex Luger and Road Warrior are going at it. And here comes Stevie Ray. Yeah. So w- we wanted to sort of show that, you know, these guys were friends. Of course, in theory, Road Warriors are supposed to be friends with Sting and Lex Luger. And they've even called themselves the Brothers in Paint. Mm. But they needed a reason to sort of solidify that the odds were against the road warriors and that Lex Luger was not a good guy. Right. And of course, Lex was very upset at that time because Stevie Ray was getting ready to oil these back. Like they talked about during the, the course of an interview earlier and, and that was broken down and there Jimmy Hart's involved as well. Jimmy's telling him I've, I've got a, uh, a bar, the Tiki bar in Daytona beach love for you to come. And now we go back to the ring. I feel and, like I, I do want to remind you though, as we're about to talk about the main event for, for a second here, yeah. Zeus is actually, you know, obviously we remember him as wrestling fans from no holds barred, right. but he really made a name for himself the year prior to this with the movie Friday. Did you ever see Friday with ice cube and Chris Tucker? I never did. No, and it I is love ice cube, but tremendous. I and we have to do an episode one day and get everybody back together to do Friday. I don't know, you know, that doesn't have to be timely or something that's in a poll, but one day when I talk you into doing another one of these, we got to do Friday because it is a phenomenal movie. It's hilarious, but he played a character named Debo who was like the neighborhood bully uh-huh. and, and you would love it. Here comes the Harlem hangover. Woo. And here comes the finish, uh, which is going to be a chair to the back. And that is what was foretold by a Hawk. There's the only way you can beat me is to buy cheating because you can't beat us straight up. And there it was one, two, three. And the fans are ecstatic because they're glad this shit's over. That's exactly right. Yeah. Let's get on to the main event. Uh, and because the main event is going to outstink them all. Meltzer did make a good point. He says the negative to the finish is that they had used chairs previously during the match rather than protecting it for the finish. That seems sort of common sense, but it didn't happen here. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Stevie Ray, boy, he's really laying that chair in, wasn't he? Hello. Suckers got to know. Suckers got to know. What's Stevie Ray doing in real life these days? Uh, I know he's living in Houston. I talked to him, had him on my radio show many months ago. Uh, he's got a podcast too. And it's, it's called straight shooting with Stevie Ray. Um, but what he's actually doing, I don't know. You know, a lot of people are wanting to know, Hey, how am I going to get my Tony fix? I don't know that everybody listening knows about your wrestling radio show. Tell everybody where they can listen online for that. Pro wrestling Wednesday.com or 92, nine, the game.com. It's 92, nine, the game in Atlanta. That's how you can hear us. And you can, your show is when if people want to listen live, uh, Wednesday's nine o'clock Eastern, which yeah, but it's going to change during baseball season because I've got baseball. Anyway, go follow 92.9 The Game. Obviously, Mm -hmm. he is not very, he being Tony, pronouns pal, is not very active on social media, but if you want your weekly fix of Tony Schiavone, he's got a radio show, man, so you can listen online and and enjoy that every single Wednesday. And follow us at PWW929. That's PWW929 on Twitter, as well as uh, PWW929. And now, here we go. All right, Bobby the Brain Heenan and the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes Dream. Uh, we have seen quite a clusterfuck of a night. Well, I just let me tell you a couple of things about what we're going to see. I booked something like this back in 1988, and now they've taken it to a whole new level, a brand new, whole new level. Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man Randy Savage and the Mega Powers are going to try to go through the gauntlet, Bobby the Brain Heenan. Well, it, it, it never seems to work. Hogan comes in. Look at Look at this structure over here to my left. Hogan comes in, he takes over the promotion, and now he's going to, Macho Man Randy Savage are going to start at the, I guess, the top of the cage and move their way all the way down and beat up every motherfucker in the ring to prove that Hulk Hogan is the biggest star in the sport. He doesn't have to prove that to anybody, especially not to you, Shivani, because we all know. Yeah, that's right. We all do know this. Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man Randy Savage, the mega powers, if you will, will be going through not one, not two, not three, not five, but eight fucking men. Thumbs up to that. Working their way all the way down. Yes. And they have to pin or they, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. What, what, what do you want to say, Eden? There are no rules, you stupid, fat Italian motherfucker. Because Hulk Hogan's in this thing. 
It's his rules. We're all playing by his rules. Don't you understand that? It's his rules. So don't go telling me about rules, you stupid piece of shit. Well, you know, he's right about that. There are no rules. And I know Kevin Sullivan is a booker, and I was the booker. And Kevin said, should we do this? Help Hulk Hogan put himself over. And I said, Hulk Hogan does not need to be put over because he is Hulk Hogan. He's bigger than anybody here. He's bigger than the booty man. He's bigger than the nature boy, Ric Flair. At least he thinks he is. And he's bigger than the ultimate solution. Do you know, Bobby Heenan, they've got a guy here called the ultimate solution? Do you realize what that's from? Yep, I realize what that's from. That's from World War II. Fuck, what are we doing? Let's go to the ring. I'm glad you brought that up because originally he was named the final solution, but there were yeah. lots of complaints from Jewish organizations at the uh, Turner corporate office. So you guys changed right. it. Uh, to the he, ultimate solution. Right. He was better known as Jeep Swenson. He wrestled in world class in the 80s. He even had uh, some matches with Bruiser Brody there. And then he was in No Holds Barred as a pit fighter. Uh, he also played James Conn's bodyguard in um, Bulletproof. Right. And I believe he was Bane in Batman and Robin. So yes, he was. Right. He, he did a lot of stuff, but unfortunately, he passed away just about a year after this in um, 1997. He was only 40 years old. But Hulk Hogan, Davy Boy Smith, James Conn, they were all there to speak at his funeral. So he was a, a well liked guy. Did you ever have any interaction with uh, Jeep? No, I never did. But Jeep was well known to have the biggest arms in all the world. Look at this spectacle here with unbelievable pyro and what a contraption. Tony, how long did it take Klondike and company to build this fucking, I don't even know. What would you call that? I mean, I don't want to call it the doomsday. That's hokey. Yeah, this monstrosity. I, yeah. I, I, I think Klondike may, may not have been involved in this. I think this was a series of uh, welders and uh, architects. And I mean, there's a lot, there was a lot of money put into this to just to build it, to get it up. But there was a lot of money put into this to design this thing too. And again, it's WCW spending more money than it needs to spend for something like this. If I'm at ringside, front row ringside Can't and see bought shit. seats, I'm pissed off. Can't see shit. Yeah. I am really pissed off because the main event, the thing the doomsday cage, the thing that we've been selling the whole thing about is now all the way down to my left or all the way down to my right. I'm really put woo. A rare Ric Flair entrance with no robe. Yeah. It doesn't feel like a Ric Flair match if there's no robe. I mean, I can't, I don't think you could count many times that that ever happened, but it happened here. And there of course is Arn Anderson, who uh, is definitely dressed differently as well. The taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan, and of course, Lex Luger with Jimmy Hart. So you got lots of managers here because unfortunately Rick came to the ring with two women who've now passed away, both woman mm -hmm. and miss Elizabeth. And they're all going to single file up these series of staircases here. It, it's a, it's an interesting contraption and concept, but I thought the same thing you just talked about, like how much fucking money did they spend on this thing? If you had to ballpark a guess between designing it, constructing it, you know, the whole deal. What do you think the investment in this contraption was? It's north of 10 grand. Oh, it's well above that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, of course, you know, you're, you're in, into housing and, and building and things like that, you know, better than I do. And this is 1996, but a lot of the money is put into the design of this. Well, and you've also got guys who get an order like this and they realize, Oh, this is for Turner home entertainment. Oh, this exactly. is for a big television company, right? Oh, this is a pay-per-view. Well, I'm going to fucking hit a lick. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, you can see Arn here walking around like, what the fuck have I gotten myself into? Right. I'd much rather be in Pensacola giving spine busters, but instead I'm in fucking Tupelo and sweatpants on chain mill. Interesting thing here. And, and I noticed this when it happened, Kevin Sullivan being the booker now is talking to Arn and Rick about what they're, what to do. Tell him exactly what they're going to do. Call little spots here. Let him know which way Hulk Hogan will come in. Uh, I thought that was very interesting. That the booker was calling some shots in front of the camera here. Well, but you know, if you're at home, he, he sort of positioned himself as the architect behind the end of Hulkamania. So it makes sense that he would be sort of calling the shots. I, I do chuckle at Arn Anderson here in his goddamn pajamas. 
uh, <laughs> thinking about um, how silly this was. Uh, oh, what what a cage! Now uh, it's uh, it's it's eight men total: uh, the Barbarian and Ming, uh, the Taskmaster Luger, Flair, and Arn, and then uh, the Ultimate Solution and Z Gangster or G Gangster. Which one was it? G it's, it's Z Gangsta. Here gangsta. he comes, Hulkamania Ooh, running bum, wild. Bum, 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 bum. And he's going to point up. I'm going to go up to the cage. Yo, pasta rules, baby. And now, again, the Macho Man Randy Savage. Big deal. And again, here, I'm a ringside fan, and I'm going to get a chance to see Hulk Hogan up close. Nope, you're not. The guys who paid a lot less money are going to and get the high fives from the Macho Man Randy Savage. Wouldn't have been a bad idea. And I know we're we're doing this, so we do all this all the time. Wouldn't have been a bad idea for Hulk Hogan, the Macho Man, Randy Savage, to go around the ring and give everybody high fives. Well, just wait, Tony, because <laughs> the silly shit that is WCW, yeah, uh, is going to uh, continue. Okay. Macho Man here in the colorful red and yellow, but wearing a black and white Macho Man shirt, um, sort of out of character for. The macho man. But then again, all of it is, we didn't see Arn wear his fucking pajamas to the ring very often. We never saw Ric Flair, almost never come to the ring without a robe. Um, unfortunately, of course he has two women who accompanied him to the ring. Who've now made their way or they came to the cage and now they're back at the ring. They've since passed on both woman and miss Elizabeth. Right. So the gimmick here is we've got to work our way down. We've got Ming and Barbarian on the middle level. We've got Ric Flair and Arn Anderson on the top level. And Macho Man is starting off with Ric Flair. Arn Anderson, of course, about to hook it up with the biggest star in the history of the business, Hulk Hogan. Mm. Well, here they go. And remember, it's a gauntlet. They have to fight their way through all. In other words, what we've got here in front of us, uh, Conrad Thompson, is the fact that we are going to show that Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man Randy Savage The mega powers, if you will, are bigger than life, and they can beat anybody. They can beat any combination. When the odds are against them, when they're put into this monstrosity of a triple cage, the, uh, what was it called again? Doomsday cage. Thank you very much. The doomsday cage, they can still fight through all the odds. And the nature boy, Ric Flair, is paired off with the macho man, Randy Savage, and he runs Flair's head into the cage. I don't think that surprised anybody. And now we go to the... Uh, split screen. Oh, Jesus Christ. What a clusterfuck this is. You know, you can't yeah. see much of shit. We've got the split no. screen that you hate so much. The fans yeah. can't really see anything either. Right. Um, it's not television friendly. It's not well lit. It, I know they're trying to make it look gritty and whatever, yeah. but there's sort of an edict that we don't want blood and mm-hmm. we're doing a cage match. And originally yeah. the plan for this match, according to Dave Meltzer, was it was supposed to be Hulk Hogan versus four heels. You know, he's been trying to work his way through the dungeon of doom. And this is supposed to be Hulk Hogan versus four men, but they decide, Hey, this is our main event extravaganza against WrestleMania. So let's make it even bigger. Let's do this triple cage and let's bring in more guys. So according to the original plan, according to Dave Meltzer, it was supposed to be Chris Benoit versus Macho Man, Randy Savage in a false count anywhere match. But Hulk Hogan decides, nope, brother, we need more bad guys. And I only need one more partner and I want it right. to be the macho man. Do you remember that being sort of the, the, the decision-making and how they sort of audible to this, that it was originally yeah. Savage and Benoit. Yeah, that, that uh, they, they audible to this because it's what Hulk Hogan who had full control of his character wanted to do. And, and, and look, it, it's pretty apparent the, this doomsday cage, as they say, is and we're taking a good shot look at it now is unique in itself it's uh an event in itself if you just look at it it looks incredible but the fact is it was meant to put hulk hogan over over everybody and and really if you think about it it was it, it was make it was I guess Hogan's partner was the macho man Randy Savage here, but it was also making Hogan look bigger than Savage. Does that make any sense? Oh, he's gonna hook up on the nature boy Ric Flair, who's gonna beg off. I feel like I should uh, remind everybody that Brian Pillman was supposed to be a part of this match as well. And you guys actually mentioned that briefly in commentary where you're saying something like you're not really sure where he is. And the next day on Nitro, Eric Bischoff would make up some sort of lame excuse like 
Pillman wasn't here because he refused to team up with Kevin Sullivan. But the reality is he had had throat surgery a couple of weeks prior at Vanderbilt university. And Gene Oakland was on the hotline saying that Pillman didn't have the surgery and was making it up. And he said that he called the hospital and they had no record of Brian Pillman being there. And this resulted in a legal letter coming from Pillman's agent to Oakland, uh, that says that, um, you know, Hey, here's the official discharge paperwork. He was actually there and he wants a retraction on nitro, a correction to be made. And Oakland, of course, missed that nitro with the flu, but you guys knew that he wasn't going to be able to make it right. by Thursday, but you had already sort of filmed the WCW Saturday night on Wednesday. So there wasn't really a chance to tape anything different, but you could have maybe edited the last minute push for the pay-per-view, but it didn't wind up happening. Uh, we should remind everybody that this is all going on when Pillman is working an angle with WCW and doing some stuff with ECW. Um, what was the, the thinking about Brian Pillman sort of not being a part of this as you know, maybe was once upon a time suggested that he'd be a big part of this match. Well, his throat surgery, you know, Brian had a very raspy, horsey voice and this throat surgery that he had at Vanderbilt was a shoot was legit. And that was just Gene Oakland trying to put something on the hotline to make you want to call. It was, you know, the hotline was, was, was working you to think it was a shoot a lot of times. And a lot of times they would throw in shoots. Uh, I, I, I was really surprised, uh, to hear that they wanted a, a retraction from that because, the hotline in itself was not as big as this. And the hotline was something that was to a much smaller audience. Uh, but we all knew that Pillman was hurt, uh, and, uh, couldn't, couldn't work. And, uh, it was just one, one of those WCW clusterfucks. The rumor and innuendo is that Brian Pillman, when he did the whole, I respect you Booker man shit with Kevin Sullivan, and then goes shows up in ECW and is doing all sorts of craziness there. Uh, threatening to pee in the ring and what have you, he's really making a spectacle of himself and he's got a lot of internet buzz and a lot of dirt cheap buzz. Wade killer reports that Hulk Hogan is the guy behind the scenes, pushing to add Brian Pillman to the cage match specifically because he was on Hogan's radar with all the attention he'd been getting lately. And he wants to leg drop and pin him. And Mm. Pillman Mm. hates this idea because he realizes Hey, if I say I'm, I've, I've quit and I'm working with ECW and I'm a free agent and I can do what I want to do, then coming back and getting leg dropped on pay-per-view by Hulk Hogan does me no favors. And originally Hulk Hogan was supposed to beat up Brian Pillman and Zeus, who we're going to see as the Z gangsta and Swenson were supposed to save him, but Pillman just refused to cooperate with Hogan and pulled away from him when Hogan grabbed him. So there's lots of speculation as to, is he going to show up for the pay-per-view? Are we getting worked again? What's real? What's not real. If he can't make it, will they put one man gang or shark or warlord or who will be in this last spot? What do you remember about Brian Pillman? Maybe being difficult to work with here and, and the rumor that Hulk Hogan just wanted to squash him. Well, okay. Two things here about Brian Pillman. You know, Brian was, I I really thought that Brian Pillman took his craziness to a whole new level. And I thought it was all the work with him, all his, you know, people really thought that Brian had snapped. There were people in the business that that thought that that Brian Pillman is fucking nuts now. And you you can't do anything. You can't do business with him. And he's fucking nuts. And uh, Hogan thought it was a work too. And and Hogan thought that he could uh, squash Brian Pillman and Pillman just, just bucked up about it. But we all also knew that he was, that he was having throat surgery. So it's like, who do you believe here? Right. Does this make sense to you? I mean, it was, it's kind of. Not, none of this makes sense. We just saw barbarian clothesline Haku with macho yeah. man ducked out of the way. Yeah. So we've got two on one with macho man versus the faces of fear. And the other right. side We've got Lex Luger and Kevin Sullivan taking Hulk Hogan to task. So the, the mega powers, which they're openly referred to here as have yeah. escaped, uh, the four horsemen and they're on this middle level. And there is a lot of stuff going on here, man. Uh, so they, they've escaped the four horsemen. 
Uh, and see, I thought the, the idea was if, if they pin one of them, they get to go to the next level. And see, that's where I, that's where I was screwed up in, in calling this match. Well, nobody fucking knows what's going on. That's the right. idea. Right. And, and so, and, and so the idea is, you know, it's such an extravaganza. It's such an event. It's so crazy. It's such a visual. It doesn't matter. That's, Mel- there was a lot of people who thought that Meltzer wrote, um, there they face Sullivan, Luger, Ming, and Barbarian. They locked Ming and Barbarian in the half of the middle cage, and the other four wound up in the wrestling ring. Finally, Jeep and Zeus, who weren't even there at the beginning, parentheses, right. Shivani kept asking where Jeep, Zeus, and Pillman were, still hinting that Pillman would be there, even though he wasn't, taking the bait and switch well past any bo- any point of sensibility mm-hmm. showed up. Um, so... Even here, you're still sort of talking about Brian Pillman. Obviously that's on orders from Eric Bischoff. I'm sure. Yeah, that's right. So you see, uh, Kevin Sullivan sort of wrestling with Pee Wee Anderson here. Uh, they're trying to use some different weapons on Randy Savage and you can see how much give there is in this, the fencing every time they're walking on it. I mean, you're, you've got several hundred pounds and this K I mean, if I'm macho man, there's no way I'm dropping elbows on this damn thing. Yeah, you knew the smartest man around here now is Rick yeah. Flair. He's yeah. still in the top cage. He's not good. Arn went down. Flair stayed up top. Like fuck it, <laughs> I'm not going to take the chance to go through the. Look at Kevin Sullivan here. Has yeah. a lot of confidence in this scaffold, and a lot of times the the pipes here on the scaffolding, you know, will just very easily move on you. Well, he has a lot of confidence here because he's teasing that he's going to fall from the second level, and he's. No, I mean, this is not something that's advisable yeah. on any level. No, but it's a booker trying to make it work, trying to make it exciting. And, uh, not only that, you know, the guys had a chance to walk through this thing and take a look at it before they, so he was pretty confident that it wouldn't fall forward. This is not wrestling though. You know, I no, mean, you're on a not. fucking scaffold, two stories high and you're sweaty and you're in your fucking underwear and wrestling boots. And you're trying to hang on and make sure you can dangle part of your body and not die. Like, yeah. what, what are you doing? Okay. I understand it's not wrestling. And I hate to say this because I'm a part of MLW, but bringing, uh, having a match where fans bring weapons to the ring for you, is that wrestling either? Well, here's what I mean, I guess. If that happens within the confines of a ring, then yeah. there's no real danger and you're in control of how what sort of velocity you put behind one of those weapons and which ones you choose. And with this, you're just, you're a, you're a fucking stunt man because there's no crash pad below. If one of these things gave way and Kevin Sullivan fell and yeah. died live on pay-per-view, that's different than hitting a guy with a fucking keyboard, Tony. Yeah. I, I, I now you, you're right. I stand corrected on that. You're exactly right. And here's my okay. struggle with this. This is this doomsday cage. It's the most devilish device ever. We're fucking out of it. Now we're just brawling. Right. How is it this grandiose? Oh my God. Look at that thing. They're going to murder each other. Nope. They're already out. They're in the aisleway. They're headed towards the ring. Yeah. I don't understand it. Well, I do. Well, smarten me up. It it feels like, you know, if you've got this, how can they ever escape? Well, they just fucking open the door and walk out. Well, what they, again, what they wanted to do was uh, give the fans a ringside. What the hell? They got a, a microphone there. Well, they had fans hand them weapons and they hit them with it. No, that's, that's not wrestling, right? <laughs> Very well done there. Millennial. Uh, and the down goes, uh, so now the fans get to pop at ring cycle. We spent all this money for it. Uh, but meanwhile, let's do a, for you fans watching at home, let's do a split screen to completely fuck you up. Hmm. Feel free to talk here anytime. Yeah, I don't know what to say about this fucking thing. We haven't seen Jeep Swenson. We haven't seen the ultimate solution, if you will. We haven't seen Tiny Lister. Yeah, Zeus Tiny Lister, or, or Tony Tiny Lister, aka Zeus, you actually met during his first run with the WWF. And of course, yes. a year prior to this, he had a lot of fame with the movie Friday, where he played Debo. Uh, yeah. which was a hilarious movie with ice cube and Chris Tucker. Did you ever see Friday, Tony? Never saw, never saw Friday. No, I don't but think I like, I've always liked ice cube. Always liked him. Thank God they're going back towards the, or are they going to get, get back in the cage? I like what? 
Well, there there were very few fans can see them right they're brawling on the floor here. And I'm not going to say it's bad action. I mean, they're, they're doing their best to have a brawl, but right. it sort of defeats the purpose of going to the trouble and expense of building this whole cage. If you're only going to use it for a handful of seconds and you're done. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And just uh, look at stuff like this. And I wonder like by the minute what that thing yeah. cost. And it was a one-off. And I realized that if it, Bischoff were listening to this, he would say, that's fucking stupid. It's a television company and look how much money they spend setting up a scene you know, or yeah. blowing up a car or whatever. Sure. I get it. We did a lot of that too. Uh, I, I have a question. What uh, did, did, was there any critique of our announcing job for this? Yeah. Everything you did I'm sucks. Honest, everything you okay. did sucks. Yeah. Okay. Cause I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know what to say here. I have no idea what to say. I mean, it's just uh, all broken down. They're going to sell back towards the ring here. Apparently once again, uh, and, uh, here's the thing. At the end of this, I remember the Macho Man and Hogan escape the cage and win, right? Well, they're out. They're out already. That's what I'm saying. So it's like, how do you explain? You know, if the rules are you beat this guy, you go to this level. You beat this guy, you go to this level. Well, what do you do when they go to the ring? Like, who's deciding what a win is now? Like, if Hulk Hogan were to pin Lex Luger right now, there's no referee in the ring. Does he win? And yeah. Macho Man chasing down Randy Savage with planks from the bottom of the cage. Uh, I think he hit the female ref for a female photographer. She no sold the shit out of it. Yeah. Linda Rufio from St. Louis. Uh, and she's been in the business a long, was in the business a long time by, by that time. I feel like we should, uh, also remind you that the other fellow who is uh, going to be a part of this, there's a little bit of controversy around him. Of course, Zeus is coming back in because he's a friend of Hulk Hogan's and Hogan sort of relied on what he knew. And so. Right. He knew that he had drawn money with John Tenta and honky tonk man and big boss man and Jim Duggan and macho man. But he also knew that he drew money with Zeus. So he has the idea, Hey, let's bring him in. He's a guy who's recognizable. Of course, the WWF owned the name Zeus. So they have to come up with something else. Were you pleased to hear about the return of tiny Lister or when did you first hear about Z gangsta? Well, I first heard about him, uh, probably like a month or two months prior to this event. And, uh, personally I was, I was okay with it because, you know, I, I called that match at, uh, at the Meadowlands in SummerSlam of 89 and uh, tiny was a cool guy, man. I, he was a cool guy and I liked working with him and, uh, he was, I always got the feeling that he, you know, he wanted to, he wanted to do things. He wanted to do things that he thought were right. He didn't have an overinflated ego and not do this and not do that. And I always thought that was cool about him. So I thought it was pretty cool that tiny was coming back in. There's a famous interview that our, our friend, uh, Peter Rosenberg did with tiny Lister. And obviously Tiny's a big deal in the hip hop community because of the movie Friday. Right. And he asked him about wrestling and he talked about the first run of course, but then he talked about coming back to WCW and he said something like, if Hulk Hogan wants to pay me 50 grand to hit me in the head with a frying pan then hit uh -huh. me in the head with a fucking frying pan. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's him, man. Um, <laughs> the other guy who you're going to see here shortly is Jeep Swenson who wrestled in world-class championship wrestling in the eighties. Uh, I think he had some matches with bruiser Brody there. He was even in the no holds barred movie as a pit fighter. And he played one of James Conn's bodyguard and bulletproof. But maybe most famously, he was Bane in Batman, but he passed away uh, a year and change after this in August of 97 from heart failure. He was only 40, uh, but he made an impression, man, because Hulk Hogan, James Caan, Davey Boy, they were all at his funeral. So Jeep was, I guess, known as to be a, a good guy in the business. What can you tell us about Jeep? I never really hear people talk about him. I didn't know. I didn't know Jeep at all. Uh, but from what I heard, he was a good guy. Now he did play the first Bane in the Batman and Robin movie. I do believe he did not play Bane in the, the latest incarnation of Bane. Oh, he didn't come back from the dead. Didn't come from the back, back from the dead. Okay. Cause I just no, said he died in 97. So if you okay. weren't sure fans, okay. uh, we did not re there. He is right there. Woo. Take a look at him and he's all painted up biggest arms in the business. Boy, Tony Lister looking big as well, isn't he? Yeah, and he's he's got the unibrow in serious yeah. effect here. And, of course, they're supposed to be in the bottom of the cage, I suppose. Yeah. But instead, all the action's at the ring, and it looks like the baby faces are taking over with Lex Luger and Kevin Sullivan. 
So Zeus is out here to massage Randy Savage's shoulders and go, ah, uh, big point of contention here. And I understand that, but you know, uh, uh, there was arguments, uh, not arguments, but discussions in the back, you know, if we're going to have this monstrosity, well, what about the people who were at ringside? So I guess they're giving them something to ringside, but now the ultimate solution and, uh, Zeus, if I can use that term here on this podcast, are going to put them back in the ring. And now they're going to put them back in the ring so they can escape and win. <laughs> Figure that one out fans. Yeah. First one out wins, but now we're going to go back in because everybody's already out. And speaking right. of out, people were out on the original name for the ultimate solution. Originally he was called the final solution. Mm -hmm. And apparently a bunch of uh, complaints came in from Jewish organizations to Turner's corporate right. office. And they changed it to the final solution. Uh, you know, smarten everybody up because not everybody listening was born in 1981, as you like to point out. Well, the final solution was Hitler's way of exterminating the Jews in in World War II. I mean, doesn't that, that was, seem like that would be something people would have fucking thought about before they named it that? Yeah, I know. And I would. Kevin Sullivan talked. It was Kevin Sullivan's idea to come up with the final solution. Uh, and then Eric got with him and said, you know, from the top, you can't do that. So uh, again, you know. Uh, Kevin was like Dusty, very old school. You know, you can do all kinds of shit back in the old days in the yeah. territory. And that's the thing. It's not like if it's Kevin Sullivan, it's someone who just didn't think of that. Kevin Sullivan's a very smart man. He knew all about it. He knew all about it and knew he was yeah. going for heat. Right. And, but maybe Turner would say it's the wrong kind of heat. This is a company that gets wide shots on blood. Right. You know, and you can't use weapons. So I'm pretty sure we can't have a nickname for exterminating Jews on the pay-per-view. Right. No. And, and, but uh, Kevin being old school thought he'd get away with it. You know, I mean, back in the old school days, they got away with using, uh, music without licensing, without paying licensing fees back then. You realize that in the old territories and wrestling a weird deal, man. Yeah. I Where know. someone is like, Hey, let's make sure they really hate him. Let's yeah. name. God, <laughs> you know, cause here's the deal. I got to tell you, like being from Alabama, I didn't put that together, but you know, I was a fucking knucklehead kid. I didn't know any of the history of that. And I, I mean, I didn't even, I certainly didn't know a Jewish person at the time in Alabama. So that wasn't yeah. it been, it wouldn't have even been on my radar, but a guy yeah. like Kevin Sullivan, he yeah. fucking knew. Yeah. Hashtag millennial bullshit. And now the double team here from the back, Hogan and Zeus are going to go eye to eye right now. I don't think the fans really give a shit. Do you? No, I don't think anybody can really tell what's going on either. No. No, because it gets down to what, it, what it gets down to is Zeus and Jeep Swenson against Hogan and the macho man, Randy Savage. we got them back in the ring. Now they're going to try to escape. How he had that look, buddy, man, a badass look, you know, and here's the thing too. Like if you were a wrestling fan and that's what they were obviously trying to do is, is cater to the people who maybe grew up on Hulk Hogan. Right. I mean. Zeus was a big deal. And I know that, you know, we can certainly beat up that he wasn't a great wrestler and maybe it wasn't the best angle and blah, 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 but it was a big deal. So to have him in here, I think makes sense. You know, on some respect, you think it might be an attraction or whatever, but man, the execution of this is just fucking awful. Is it not? Yeah. Look, it's one of those things that someone had a great idea. And then after they had the great idea and they started selling it, you got us all of a sudden say, well, we got to execute it. We got, and then they look at this thing and says, yeah, we got to execute it. And then they think, well, we got to give the fans a ringside something. So it just ended up being one of the biggest clusterfucks ever. And why not Arn Anderson getting involved as well? And why not Ric Flair getting involved as well? Well, and that's what I was going to say is, you know, at least in the WWF, when they knew that they had Zeus, like they know, Hey, he can't fucking do anything. So right, let's right. get macho man in there to do all the real work. Right. And then let's let, you know, him just come in do a few power moves, get some heat and macho man can do all the work. But here for several minutes, it was Bane or, you know, Jeep Swenson and tiny Lister. Neither one of those guys really fucking know what they're doing. No, there's no worker in there. And somebody on the outside, probably Kevin Sullivan went and said, on flail, get in there. They're fucking dying. <laughs> Go sell hear, something. God damn it. <laughs> I could hear him. I could hear him saying that you're seeing the difference in the WWF booking Pat Patterson, getting involved, 
Vince McMahon getting involved and Hulk Hogan booking a match. That's what you're seeing. Well, if because Hulk Hogan, was, this. Hulk Hogan wasn't thinking about matches, right? Hulk Hogan's thinking about Hulk names Hogan. and what would look cool as a name. But right. then you actually think about just the mechanics of a match. Like, man, somebody has got to make you look good. And these guys don't know how to make themselves look good. Right. So you got to get an Arn Anderson or a Ric Flair in there and a macho man. But if you've got seven Hulk Hogan's, that's not a fucking, it's not going to work. <laughs> and here's the powder. And you yeah. see one powder packet has exploded. Nobody fucking knows why or how yeah. macho man is actively working to open something up. We had way too tight of a shot. Here comes the fucking booty man. And the booty man has decided here's what you need to kill these monsters. Frying pans. <laughs> oh, there's the powder. Got him down. Hit him in the head. Oh, hit him in the head. Go ahead. Hit him in the head. Come on. Get oh, ow. <laughs> Here's a guy who paralyzed kinda... my brother, Randy Zeus. Oh. I gotta, I gotta overpower him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Fucking frying pan. Hey, here's a guy who wants to kill all the Jews. Hey, I got an idea. <laughs> I can take him down. Give me a fucking frying pan. <laughs> This is what WCW is, man. It's the doomsday uh, cage. And instead yeah. of there being, you know, kendo sticks and barbed wire and thumbtacks and other nonsense. Nope. What's your, what are your weapons, pal? Well, got some powder, got us a frying pan. What are you going to do with it? going to bake a fucking cake. It's very apparent that, uh, thanks to the advent of the NWO, uh, we, we strung this thing along a little bit, didn't we? Because without that, we were going to die long before 97. <laughs> okay. Luger's putting on a glove here. I don't know uh, if this is to hide something he did with Elizabeth or what. Let's uh, see. Yeah. Well, if the glove don't fit, you can't convict. What uh, the fuck was it? that? <laughs> <laughs> did you see that? Did he do that on purpose? Dude, he, I, you have to see what we just saw. If you're not watching watch along, you have to watch watch along for this. I just can't believe what we just saw. <laughs> and now all of a sudden Hulk Hogan and Macho Man decide. Hey, let's run out. But Macho Man says, oh, no, I forgot to pin him. And there you go. There's the one, two, three. And Hulk Hogan, the Macho Man, win this thing. Uh, We're going to shut the cage. And now we're going to go. What what, what did we just watch? Oh. The big finish. I mean, they couldn't even get that right. You've got Ric Flair restraining the Macho Man. Lex Luger winding up with what we're led to believe is a loaded glove. And he's going to oh, rear back yeah. and punch the macho man, but he pulls short when the macho man ducks and then he just reloads and punches flair. Hmm. And they both try to jump out of the ring, the baby faces to escape, to win, which I guess they won an hour ago. Um, but we're supposed to not remember that. And then Hogan says, Oh brother, go pin him. So flair has to lay there. Let macho man slide back in and pin him. I don't know why we had to have flair lose either. I don't know why ultimate solution couldn't lose or Z gangsta. It's more Ric Flair, Hulk Hogan bullshit. Is it not? Yes, it is. And it's also Ric Flair being a pro. I'm down with it because in the end, wins and losses don't matter. Look at how silly that shit was, but I'm just saying you got all these guys who aren't going to be back ever again. Fucking beat one of them. I agree. Absolutely agree. And now the three stooges. Larry, fat ass, Tony and Mo have to make some sense out of it. But now we're going to talk about nitro tomorrow night, obviously, and point towards that. Well, and what's interesting is Ric Flair's your world champion. And so the giant, when he won the match earlier, earned a world title match against Ric Flair tomorrow night on nitro. So you just had your champion get pinned in the main event. And now we're immediately trying to say, oh. What's going to happen tomorrow night in the world title match? We didn't keep Flair strong for the match at all. It's just silly shit, man. Yeah, but it was a foreign object. It was a foreign object that hit him. Oh, the dreaded coal miners glove. Process this. This is the deadliest cage ever. It's the doomsday cage. Inside, powder, frying pans, gloves. Are we going to make the most brutal match in history? Or are we going to be uncensored baking? Yeah, well, guess what? It was doomsday for WCW had they continued on this road. But, uh, Thank- here's my favorite part of the whole thing, too, is is Dusty Rhodes here, who's got on a tuxedo jacket and fucking blue jeans. Like, I can't believe I got dressed up for this shit. <laughs> and thank God I didn't book this shit. Thank God they were leaving me of being a booker. 
Well, what's fun too, is the, um, the credits here don't have their full names. It's just yeah. one name, which is kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, all these names, of course, we've talked about on the podcast and I got to tell you, Tony, I'm glad we got to cover this one, but man, am I glad this one's over. Yeah. It felt like that Chicago street fight match, the booty man match. And then this main event just went forever, mm-hmm. but, uh, I'm glad we got to cover uncensored 96. I feel funny even asking this, but how many stars would you give the main event? Oh, I would give a, uh, I would make it dud. Well, Meltzer didn't like it that much. He gave it okay. minus three stars. Mm, okay. Which is better than what Brian Alvarez might give it. He might yell minus five stars overall uncensored 96 thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle. What would you say? I would say thumbs down. I mean, it's gotta be right. It's gotta yeah. be. There was a lot of good look, man. You go from, uh, Conan and Eddie, and then you go to Regal and, uh, Belfast bruiser. Then you have a pretty decent match with the uh, woman versus man. But after that, it went right. It, it became a shit show after that guys. It became a shit show right after that. Well, it's been a, a fun shit show with everybody today on what happened when next week we've got the Tony Schiavone wedding special. Uh, we might even, uh, subtitle it growing up Shivani. I'm going to try to pin down all the Shivani kids. And, uh, over the next couple of weeks, Tony and I are going to try to do some things on Facebook, uh, just to interact with you and, uh, say, thanks, Tony, whenever you've got a free moment in the next week, maybe we could do a Facebook live with you taking questions about uncensored 96. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think so. That'd be a great idea. So check I- us out on Facebook. It's facebook.com forward slash WHW Monday. Of course, the archives are up on YouTube and, uh, we want to hear your interaction about this uncensored show. And don't forget this Saturday around five forty Eastern tune into Facebook live, and you'll be able to see Tony's speech from the wedding reception. It's going to be a fun time, man. You know, I'm, I'm sad to say that we're winding it down. I am hopeful that you're saying, Hey, anything's possible. You've sold me on some other shit. Maybe I could talk you into doing something every now and again, and maybe this isn't the end end. Um, but as you heard, Tony's schedule is ridiculous and, uh, it's like herding cats, even to tape our show right now. It's an emotional time for me. I've got the wedding coming up and I love all the fans and I love you, Conrad. And uh, I'm just I love everybody. Well, Tony, um, I'm sorry you're so emotional, but when I look at my clock, I realize we're desperately out of time. And yes, we're desperately out of time because in the middle of the arena in the middle of the wedding reception, Conrad Thompson going one-on-one against Lois Shivani. My God, Lois and Conrad go to hook up, and Lois is staggering. She's spinning. She's drunk. She's on her ass. Tony Shivani dives in for the one, two, three. She's done. And your winner by proxy, Conrad Thompson. We're out of time. See you next week on What Happened When Monday. What Happened When fans, check out the podcast that Conrad Thompson says is the best concept since something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. It's called Why It Ended with Robbie E. We talk to people who played the characters that you saw wrestle on TV and suddenly disappeared, and we ask why it ended. Our first episode was with Glacier himself, Ray Lloyd. And coming up this Wednesday, Mark Copany, otherwise known as Muhammad Hassan, tells us why it ended. Also, if you get a chance, I'd appreciate it if you gave a listen to Going Broadway. Going Broadway is a one-hour interview show with me, Matt Coon. And the first interview is with Brian Pillman Jr. It is an amazing, enlightening, surprising, compelling interview. You can find both of these on iTunes or goingbroadway.com for the interview with Brian Pillman or whyitended.com for Why It Ended with Robbie E. and Matt Coon. Thanks so much. We'll miss you. The rule of-